Nobody likes going to the dentist. The smell of the chemicals, the sound of the drill, the indignity of talking with someone's hands in your mouth. But as you settle into the dentist's chair, something about this particular visit feels especially wrong. Why are the hygienists looking at you like that? Who is this strange doctor entering the room? And why does your mouth feel so full all of a sudden? You can't move, you can't scream, and your teeth, they're multiplying? The man has been ignoring his persistent toothache for several weeks, but he just can't take it anymore. The dull ache has become a head-pounding throb of pain that cuts through every single thought. But of course, he waited far too long to treat it, and now here he is on a Sunday evening trying to find a dentist who will give him an appointment. It's not his fault, he tells himself. He's been terrified of the dentist since he was a little kid. It takes a lot of pain to counteract that kind of phobia, but now he's reached that threshold. As he's browsing the internet, desperate to find an office that's open on Sundays, he spots an ad. Dr. Hendricks, dentistry 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. The man isn't sure how that's possible, but the pain has made him desperate, so he calls the number on the ad and makes an appointment. The receptionist sounds a bit funny on the phone, like she has something in her mouth, but he brushes it off. Fifteen minutes later, he's walking into the office and checking in at the reception desk. The woman sitting there looks a bit unusual, but his mother raised him not to stare, so he gives her a polite, distant nod, declines her request to inspect his teeth for herself, and ignores the strange feeling in his gut at her words. Instead, he continues on to the exam room and waits for the doctor to take his pain away. He waits for quite some time, until he begins to worry that the dentist forgot about him. Or perhaps this office really was too good to be true, and this is some sort of scam. But then the door opens, and in comes Dr. Hendricks with a cheerful demeanor and a smile in his eyes. His mouth is covered with a surgical mask, so the man can't be certain, but he seems like he's definitely smiling. It's a good thing the man came in so quickly, the dentist assures him. His teeth are in dire straits. But don't worry, he's in very, very good hands, and by the time he walks out of the office, he'll be in great shape. The man asks the dentist if he can be put under for the procedure in order to prevent him from panicking. The dentist laughs uproariously at this request, but he agrees. He places a gas mask over the man's face, and the hissing sound of the gas fills the room. The man's eyes grow heavy, and the sterile white room fades to black. When the man wakes up, he's sitting on the sidewalk outside of the office, a plastic bag of mini mouthwash clutched in his hand, and his mouth, oh god, his mouth. It's aching like nothing he's ever felt before. But something else is wrong, too. He reaches up to feel around his mouth with his fingers, and all the color drains from his face. His mouth is absolutely crowded with teeth. So many teeth, his tongue can't move without poking up against them. He expected to leave the dentist with one tooth missing, but instead, somehow, he has 30 more than he started with. Unfortunately for this man, who only wanted to have a toothache treated, he stumbled into the clutches of SCP-5150. SCP-5150 is a dental office located outside the northwestern perimeter of Indianapolis, Indiana. The office building occupies an area of approximately 140 square meters, and the interior measures 115 square meters. The building is unremarkable in every way, with the exception of an electrical sign above the building's front entrance, which reads, Dr. John Hendricks, DDS. Inside the building, there are six rooms and several anomalous entities designated SCP-5150-1, SCP-5150-2, and SCP-5150-3. SCP-5150-1 is the dental office's receptionist. Of course, as you may have already gathered, she is no ordinary receptionist. The entity has standard humanoid features, with the exception of the oral cavity. The entity's maxillary and mandibular bones, or upper and lower jaw, are disfigured and mutilated and have been noted to have missing incisors, extra canines, and bleeding gums. The entity seems to have an intense interest in human teeth, and once she has gotten her hands on some, her anomalous properties will begin to manifest notably. She will insert stolen human teeth into her mouth and into her gums. This appears to be intended to correct the issues with her oral cavity, but the exact motivation for this behavior is still unknown. Anyone who enters SCP-5150 must interact with SCP-5150-1 at her reception desk in order to continue through or exit the building, regardless of how much aggression she displays toward them. 
SCP-5150-2 refers to several anomalous dental hygienists that populate the entirety of SCP-5150, with the exception of the waiting area. These entities resemble the receptionist, but move more freely throughout the building rather than being confined behind a desk. They are similarly aggressive and will attack human subjects in order to apprehend them and bring them into one of the examination rooms. They carry a variety of dental instruments on their person and will happily use these instruments as weapons in order to subdue their victims. Once the hygienists have taken a human subject to an exam room, they will strap them to an operating table and prepare them to meet the remaining entity lurking within the office. Then it's time for the unfortunate human subject to meet the dentist himself, SCP-5150-3, also known as Dr. John Hendricks. This entity spends his time in the examination rooms as well as his personal office. When he is presented with a patient, he will begin to insert teeth directly into their mouth, where they will anomalously take root and result in extreme cases of hyperdontia. The source of these additional teeth is currently unknown. Once the operation is complete and Dr. Hendricks is satisfied with the amount of teeth he has forced into his patient's mouth, he will then attempt to give the subject a plastic bag containing a variety of over-the-counter oral healthcare products. These can include a toothbrush, dental floss, mouthwash, and toothpaste. The subjects will not be allowed to leave the building without taking this bag with them. Analysis of these products has not revealed any anomalous properties. On July 9, 2023, the SCP Foundation conducted an investigation of SCP-5150. Subject D-457142 was ordered to investigate and explore the building. He was equipped with a camera and microphone, as well as a chocolate bar, which was placed in his pocket for emergency use. Control lead was assigned to Bobby Daniels, and Marcus Drago and Andrew Fuller were additional team members on the investigation. D-457142 approached the building, but hesitated before going inside. He asked what would happen after he entered the building, but Daniels refused to elaborate. His questions went unanswered. With no other option, D-457142 entered the building. When he opened the door, a doorbell dinged to signal his entry. As the door closed behind him, he could hear a click as the lock slid into place. This sent the man into a state of anxiety, and he attempted to open the door. It wouldn't budge. He called out to control over the microphone, begging them to unlock the door promising that he would not run. Daniels at Control explained that he couldn't do anything about it, as the Foundation had no control over the doors. That lock was all SCP-5150's doing. After some hemming and hawing, D-457142 had no option but to proceed and continue into the waiting area of SCP-5150. Inside, he saw a row of four chairs, a smattering of assorted toys common to any medical waiting room, and more chairs. There off to the side was the counter, and behind a sheet of glass with a small opening approximately 1.2 meters tall and 0.8 meters wide, the receptionist was waiting. Strangely, the camera feed was not able to pick up any of the receptionist's physical features, leaving the test subject alone to observe her and try to make sense of what he was seeing. Nothing was especially out of the ordinary in the room at first glance, aside from the episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer playing on one of the waiting room TVs. The subject walked through the room taking note of everything that he saw. Then he turned to face the receptionist. The receptionist was dressed in a white collared shirt with a white face mask covering her mouth. There was a sheet of paper directly in front of her. She greeted the test subject. Hello, sir. Can I help you schedule an appointment? Unsure of what else to do, the test subject played along. He asked her how to proceed with scheduling and the receptionist handed him a pen and directed him toward the paper in front of her. She instructed him to sign and then wait for his appointment with Dr. Hendricks in five minutes. Once the subject signed the paper, the receptionist stated, Now before you can enter, there's one thing I'll need to see. The subject agreed, asking what she needed to see. The receptionist responded, Your teeth, of course. May I see them? As you might expect, the test subject found the request off-putting and inquired why she might need to see his teeth. She responded in a friendly tone. I'm currently taking online classes for dentistry and I need experience. Occasionally patients will let me take a look at their teeth so I can predict how well an appointment with Dr. Hendricks will go. Will you let me try with you?" The subject relented, opening his mouth. As soon as he did, the receptionist reached out and grabbed hold of the lower left quadrant of the man's jaw. The receptionist praised the man's teeth, exclaiming how clean they were. Then she quickly pulled a pair of pliers from underneath her desk clamping them to the bottom central incisors of the subject's mouth. 
She pulled toward herself with a sudden, sharp yank, extracting the teeth from the subject's mouth in less than one second. The test subject recoiled, clutching at his mouth and screaming in pain and shock. Blood dripped onto the camera lens as the subject struggled to wipe it away. He stumbled toward a nearby tissue box, grabbing a fistful of tissues to sop up the blood and stem the flow. Meanwhile, the receptionist went about her business. She stared at the two bloody teeth in her hand, admiration in her eyes. Next, she removed her face mask, revealing her disfigured oral cavity, and began to forcefully insert the new teeth into empty areas of her gums. As the subject backed away from the reception desk in horror, the receptionist called out, Dr. Hendricks can see you now, sir. Please head to room three for your examination. Of course, the subject was reluctant to continue into the building, but Control insisted that he go through the door leading to the exam rooms. At first, he refused, but after a reminder that he was locked in and the promise of a medical team waiting for him after the investigation was finished, he saw no option but to move forward. So he tossed his bloody wad of tissue paper in the trash and pushed through the next set of doors. As before, he could hear the click of the lock behind him, trapping him inside. He stepped carefully into the hallway, pressing his body against the left side of the wall as the sudden sound of laughter echoed through the hall. Where was it coming from? Who could be laughing somewhere like this? He wasn't sure he wanted to know the answer. He continued through the hall, edging along the wall. Suddenly, he froze, crouching down to hide as one of the hygienists exited a nearby door. The entity passed him without noticing him, entering another exam room. The subject continued until he reached the far side of the hallway where a door with the nameplate John Hendricks was waiting. He opened the door and entered. There was no one inside. He checked in with Control, asking for instructions on what to do next. Control advised him to look for anything that could potentially be important. Documents, research papers, journal pages, anything that might shed some light on the nature of SCP-5150. He obeyed and began to search the desk, but found it was empty. Just then, the door to the office opened, and a hygienist called out to the subject, What are you doing? We have another room waiting for you. At this point, cornered and with nowhere to run, the test subject grabbed his emergency chocolate bar and unwrapped it. At the sight of the sugary treat, the hygienist screamed and backed away. Two other entities appeared, wielding sharp double-sided probes used during dental examinations. The three entities advanced toward the subject. In a panic, he threw the chocolate bar and it collided with the third hygienist. The entity shrieked, its mouth beginning to bleed as its teeth rapidly decayed. But now the subject was left unarmed and could not defend himself against the assault of the other two entities. They grabbed hold of him, one entity stabbing the subject with the probe while the other bit down on his exposed forearm hard enough to draw blood and crack the bone. As he cried out in pain and fear, with no one able to save him, the subject was dragged to exam room three. There, the hygienist strapped him down on an operating table, tying him in place with leather straps. You can trust us, sir, one of the entities said. We'll just need to pull some teeth before the dentist arrives. At this point, the entities removed the subject's two lower canines and three molars, all while he remained conscious and screaming. Then the door opened and another entity came into the room. The doctor was in. At the sight of the dentist, the test subject began to spit various expletives. Dr. Hendricks met the verbal assault with an amused chuckle. What a tongue! Why so harsh? Don't worry, this is for your own good. I know it may be scary, but it'll all be done with soon. The dentist spotted the camera, removing it from the subject's body. Is this for a home video? Well, no matter. Technically, this does break some patient-doctor confidentiality laws, but I can let this one slide. Here, let me get this at an angle where it can record better. He placed the camera in the far right corner of the room, where it captured video of both the subject and Dr. Hendricks. All the while, the subject's mouth continued to bleed. The dentist continued to speak. There we go, much better. <laughs> now, where were we? Oh, that's right. By the looks of it, it seems like they've already started. It's a shame. Your teeth aren't looking so great right now, but that's why you're here. I can help make it all better. The dentist retrieved several medical cleaning supplies from the side of the room, as well as an array of syringes. Then, he was ready to work. The test subject's nightmare was far from over. The dentist elevated the operating chair and inserted a Jennings gag device into the subject's mouth in order to keep it open. What happened next could have been briefly mistaken for an ordinary teeth cleaning, other circumstances aside. 
The dentist used a dental mirror and several tools to pick and scrape at the remaining teeth in the subject's mouth, as if checking for plaque and tartar. Next, however, things got a bit more gruesome. He swapped the probing tools for a dental drill and began to dig into the subject's gums and inner cheeks. The drill was used on the subject's mouth for a duration of 15 minutes. If you're concerned about the lack of anesthetic used during these procedures, allow me to clarify that various high-quality anesthetics were administered. However, they were injected in the wrong locations or at insufficient dosages to adequately reduce the subject's pain. Sadly, he was fully aware of every agonizing sensation. After two hours, the dentist cheerfully remarked, We're almost done with the cleaning. He added, You're doing just fine. See, I knew you wouldn't be so snappy after I started my work. Don't worry, I'll just have to do one more thing. But before I can do that, I'll have to move your camera. I can't allow this to be recorded. You understand, right? He turned the camera so that the lens faced the wall, preventing any visuals of what happened next from being captured. This is especially unfortunate, given that this was the point in the procedure at which the dentist's anomalous abilities manifested. The nature of these abilities is still, sadly, unknown. All that was captured by the microphone was moans of pain and the sounds of crunching as the subject's new teeth crowded into his gum line. After 20 minutes, the procedure was complete, and the dentist handed the subject a bag filled with various oral care items. Eventually, the subject was able to exit the building. When he emerged, he was pale and shaking, with splatters of blood down his shirt and an extreme case of hyperdontia. There were so many teeth present in the subject's mouth that he was unable to speak coherently. He was then taken to Site 334's infirmary, where his hyperdontia was treated and he was debriefed. After treatment, he was given amnestics and released. At this point, any further experimentation with SCP-5150 was suspended, pending the judgment of the Ethics Committee. No follow-ups were conducted with the test subject. Still, I would be personally curious to know if his ordeal left him with a lifelong phobia of the dentist even after the application of amnestics. I certainly don't believe I would ever be the same again. SCP-5150 was placed under containment within Provisional Site 334. A disinformation campaign and cover story for this provisional site was established concerning the fictional Hops Railroad Company. This was intended to hide SCP-5150 and any of its related media, including poster advertisements, newspaper articles, and social media posts. In the event of unauthorized access to SCP-5150, all personnel were required to be detained and immediately transferred to the on-site infirmary upon exiting the building. Excess teeth would be removed and stored there, and personnel would be given a thorough evaluation before being given Class C amnestics. All on-site personnel who interacted with SCP-5150 in an approved capacity were required to carry one candy bar containing a minimum of 35 grams of sugar at all times. You may be wondering why these containment procedures are detailed in the past tense. Well, there's a reason for that choice. The current containment procedures are no longer up to date, as the anomaly is no longer adequately contained. As of August 1, 2023, the building originally designated as SCP-5150 is completely absent of anomalous entities or paranormal activity. It is unknown how or why this shift took place, but the anomaly appears to have moved rather than disappeared. On September 22, 2023, posters advertising the dental practice of one Dr. John Hendricks were reported near the city of Greenwood, Indiana. All personnel assigned to Provisional Site 334 have been given a new directive, relocate and recontain SCP-5150 wherever it is migrated to. The dental health of innocent people depends on it. Remember to take good care of your teeth, brush and floss every day, and be sure to attend your regular dental checkups. And of course, always count your teeth before and after an appointment, just in case. A pair of SCP Foundation researchers open the door of a containment cell and find themselves staring at something unlike anything they've ever seen before. Sitting in the middle of the room is a giant lump that appears to be made of what can only be described as flesh. The two look at each other in disbelief. Just what is this thing? They circle the huge blob, looking it over, wondering what on earth it could be. One of the researchers finally gets the courage to actually feel it. He finds that it's warm to the touch. And does he detect some slight movement? He slowly moves to place his ear against it to listen, but a sudden shudder from the mask sends him jumping back in fright. Just then, 
The other researcher calls to him from the other side of the sphere. It sounds like he has found something. As he approaches, he too sees what caused his partner to call out. There, in the middle of this tumorous ball, is a door. It's a circular iron hatch, the kind sealed by a valve, and it's open. Now the researchers are really confused. A massive lump of living flesh is strange enough, but why does it have a door? One of the researchers peeks inside. Is that a couch they see? And a table? Does someone live in this thing? Things are getting beyond strange. The two researchers look up at the observation window where their supervisor is watching them. The supervisor does not hesitate. He nods at them, and the researchers know what they must do. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. The researcher who lost winces. He knew that coming to work at the SCP Foundation meant that he would be dealing with some strange, dangerous, and disgusting anomalies. But he never imagined he would have to climb inside a giant orb of meat. His partner opens the hatch all the way and offers a hand to help him. Knowing he has no other option, the researcher steps inside. Inside, the air is hot, thick, and moist, like a cramped gym that's had too many bodies exerting themselves on a warm, humid day. He walks through the short entranceway, and his eyes adjust to the dim light to find that he's standing in the middle of a cozy little room. A single, small lamp on a table is giving off just enough light for him to see that the room is sparsely furnished, with a few pieces including a small couch and a twin bed. Outside, his partner calls to him, asking what he can see. As the researcher turns to answer, the door snaps shut. The valve spins on its own, locking itself tight. Try as he might, the researcher can't get it to budge. He bangs on the door and yells, Is he all right in there? Is everything okay? His only response is a muffled scream from inside the ball of flesh. He keeps pulling at the door, twisting the valve with all of his strength, but it won't move. The sounds of gurgles and wet sloshing come from inside the meaty growth. An alarm starts to sound as he strains against the door, exerting himself so hard that he feels like a vein in his head might burst. Suddenly, the valve loosens, and a sudden lack of resistance causes him to fall to the floor. The valve spins on its own, and the door swings open once again. The ball of flesh is quiet once more. The researcher picks himself up off the ground and slowly, carefully, peeks inside. Hello? Are you okay? Is anyone in there? There's no response. That is, until a blast of hot air comes rushing out of the hatch, blowing the researcher's hair back. When it's over, he peeks inside again. His fellow researcher is nowhere to be seen. Inside is the same couch, bed, and table with a small lamp. But there's something new there, too. Across from the couch, where there was nothing before, is a small television. While this may seem strange, it's just another day at the SCP Foundation, where anomalous objects and creatures are studied and contained, including SCP-002, also known as The Living Room. SCP-002 is the designation given to a large, tumorous, fleshy growth. It's roughly spherical, with a circumference just over 15 meters, giving it an estimated volume of around 60 meters cubed. Located on one side is an iron valve hatch, similar to what might be found on an old submarine, which leads into the interior of the ball. Those who step inside are surprised to discover a small room that resembles a low-rent studio apartment, complete with furniture and even a small window. Strangely, the outside of the ball of flesh shows no windows, and indeed no openings at all, save for the iron hatch. The furniture in the room displays no anomalous properties, though examination has revealed that the furniture appears to be constructed of sculpted bone, woven hair, and other biological substances, all coming from human bodies. Analysis of samples taken from the furniture has shown each to be constructed from independent and fragmented DNA sequences, several of which correspond to SCP research personnel who have been lost inside of SCP-002. To date, the living room has been responsible for seven members of staff going missing. At the same time, during the course of its containment at the SCP Foundation, the room appears to have added multiple additional furnishings, including two lamps, a throw rug, a television, a radio, a beanbag chair, three books in an unknown language, four children's toys, and a small potted plant. 
Tests have been performed using a variety of non-human entities in order to see if they would provoke a similar response from SCP-002 to that of humans. Various lab animals, including those with close DNA to humans such as chimpanzees, have been placed in the room. But so far, all have failed to make the living room react. Human cadavers were also tested, but they too did not produce any effect. It is unknown what causes SCP-002 to engage in its behavior, but whatever process it uses to convert organic matter into furnishings seems to only be triggered by the presence of living human beings. SCP-002 was discovered in northern Portugal, following reports of an object falling from Earth's orbit. There, in the bottom of a small crater, was SCP-002. It was encased in a thick shell of rock, but the anomaly's fleshy exterior could be seen through cracks that were likely created by the impact. A local farmer was the first to spot the object falling to Earth and brought word of what he found to his village. At the same time, a Level 4 SCP Foundation agent stationed in the area detected elevated levels of radioactivity and traced the source back to the crater. An SCP collection squad led by General Mulhausen was dispatched to the impact site and quickly secured the area. Test subjects from the nearby village were recruited for initial analysis of the object, with three men being individually sent inside of SCP-002, all of whom disappeared. Having confirmed this anomaly's deadly properties, General Mulhausen then issued a Level 4A termination order that would apply to any local witnesses in order to ensure that no knowledge of the object reached the outside world. He then oversaw its transport to an SCP containment facility. As Foundation staff prepped SCP-002 for relocation, four members of the security personnel were seemingly mesmerized and drawn inside the object where they too disappeared. This was the first hint that SCP-002 possesses some form of subtle mind control, with the ability to influence humans into stepping inside of it. It was after these losses that it was first noticed that the object appeared to grow new furnishings following someone disappearing inside. After these mishaps, General Mulhausen ordered all staff to wear hazmat suits when dealing with SCP-002, and following the General's own termination, SCP-002 was placed in containment at the secure facility where it currently resides. Due to the ongoing danger presented by SCP-002, the risk it poses to any who step inside of it, and the mind control abilities it possesses, it has been classified as Euclid. It is to remain connected at all times to a suitable power supply to keep it in a charging mode of some kind, which appears to make it more docile. In the event of a power outage, staff in the immediate area are to be evacuated and the object's containment cell emergency barrier is to be closed, sealing it off from the rest of the site. Once power is re-established, strobing X-ray and ultraviolet lights are to be activated in the containment cell until SCP-002 is returned to its charging mode. Research teams investigating SCP-002 that will come within 20 meters of the object must consist of no fewer than two members. Personnel should also maintain physical contact with one another at all times to confirm that the other is present and not experiencing any feelings of confusion, dulled perception, or other forms of bewilderment that may lead to them entering the living room. No personnel at all below a level 3 clearance are allowed inside of SCP-002, and any staff that have contact with the anomaly are to be escorted no less than 5 kilometers away and must undergo a 72-hour quarantine and psychological evaluation. SCP-002 is one of the oldest anomalies in the SCP Foundation database, but remains one of the least understood. Perhaps one day we'll understand what it is, and why it was at one time sitting in the orbit of Earth. Did someone send it here, intending us to one day find it? Did it come here of its own volition? Or did we put it there ourselves, in an attempt to keep it away? A worker presses down on the plunger, and moments later, a huge explosion rocks the quarry. When the dust clears, the three quarry workers look on at the pile of rocks that they'll now spend the next days and weeks hauling out. But then they spot something strange. There in the newly exposed rock face is an opening. The three men stand at the mouth of the previously hidden cave. They poke their heads inside, but it's too dark to see much of anything, except for the fact that the tunnel in the rock stretches on for at least a few meters before it turns and prevents them from seeing any further. One of the quarry workers slaps his co-worker on the back and dares him to go inside and check it out. No way, he tells him as he pulls his hand back from feeling inside the cave wall his palm now coated in a sickly slime. It's gross in there. 
The other two laugh at him. If they think they're so brave, why don't the two of them go check it out? The two men stop laughing and look at each other. Who could have ever foreseen the tables turning on them like this? But they're not going to back down. One of the two takes out a flashlight, and they step into the cave while the third waits outside. He watches as the two of them head deeper into the cave, disappearing behind the bend. Inside the cave, the floor is just like the walls, coated with some kind of substance making it wet, but also a little sticky. They half expected the cave to end right around the bend, but now they can see that it continues on. Not only is there another turn several meters ahead of them, but as they head deeper in, they find that there are branching paths too. This might just be the start of a vast cave system. There's no telling how far or how deep it might go. They better head back to the entrance before they get lost. The two turn around to start heading back towards the entrance. But wait, what was that? And they spin around. It sounded like there was a noise behind them. But there's nothing there, just the empty passageway. They must be hearing things. They really should get out of here quickly, though. Come on, let's go. As they turn to leave, though, something happens. With a sickening squishing sound, the walls of the tunnel constrict, closing up between them. He runs towards the now-closed passage and starts slapping at the moist, soft wall. But there's no response. But then he does hear something. Was that a scream? He's realized something else, too. Even though his friend had the flashlight, he can still see. While faint, the walls themselves seem to be producing a small amount of light. He yells out that he's going to get help and that his friend should hold tight and not move. He'll get him out of there. He has no idea if he can hear him, though. He starts to slowly make his way back the way he thinks they came, but the cave feels different. He's taking turns that he doesn't remember making on their short trip. He should be at the entrance already, and there seem to be more branching paths than there were before. It's hard to tell in the low light, though. Maybe he's just confused. He's hearing noises, too. Wet, writhing sounds. He's got to get out of here. The quarry worker reaches a fork in the tunnel and has no idea which is the right way to go. He doesn't remember this at all. He calls down the tunnel, but there's no answer to his cries. He hears more of those wet, slapping sounds behind him, though. He's got to keep moving. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. The left tunnel it is. He goes down his chosen path, rounds a corner, and sees another fork. What is going on here? He's got to pick, though. Eeny, meeny, miny. He screams as something leaps out of the tunnel at him. Outside the cave, the quarry worker is growing nervous. He's gotten a flashlight of his own and shines it down the tunnel, but he can't see any more than they could before. He calls out, asking if they're all right. But he's met only with silence. He turns around behind him at the empty quarry. They're the only ones working on the site that day. And if they don't get back to work soon, there's going to be some angry questions about why they spent the day horsing around inside of a cave. As much as he hates the idea, he's got to go in there and get them out. He enters the cave and goes around the first bend. He too notices how oddly sticky and slimy every surface is. But he has to press on. Maybe they were hurt and needed his help. He rounds another bend and spots something. A pair of legs sticking out from around the next turn. His friend must really have been hurt. He runs towards his injured co-worker and kneels down next to him. It looks like he's passed out on the ground and he tries to shake him awake. Are you okay? What happened? His friend moans a bit, but doesn't even open his eyes. He moans again, and this time blood starts pouring out of his mouth. The quarry worker steps back, scared at the sight of his friend's state. That's when he notices something. His friend's stomach. It's moving. He leans in close. He can see bumps swelling and moving around his abdomen. Is that? The SCP Foundation soon learned of the troubling reports and moved quickly to purchase the quarry and the surrounding lands. Those who had seen or heard rumors about the missing workers were anesthetized, and all further access to the area around the quarry was strictly controlled. The cave itself that had been unearthed was designated SCP-2385, but the Foundation needed to learn just what they were dealing with. So after a research outpost was constructed over the entrance, the investigation into what was happening inside this strange anomalous cavern system could finally begin. The first to enter the cave is D-11424, a Class D personnel, who is equipped with a shoulder-mounted camera, a Ruger LC-9 pistol, a machete, and one week's worth of rations, since it was unknown just how vast this cave system may be. D-11424 proceeds into the cave, 
It immediately reports back the same conditions that the workers had experienced, that the surfaces of the cave were soft, wet, and a little sticky, and also that they seemed to have an almost imperceptible glow. D-11424 moves deeper into the cave, but sees no sign of the missing workers, despite one of their bodies having been reported as being lost relatively close to the entrance. He's ordered to continue deeper into the cave, and radios back that the walls weren't stable. He would pass by openings in the walls that would seal off once he was passed. On more than one occasion, he saw new passages open up as well, and these didn't appear to be caused by collapses or other geological activity. The walls seemed like they were alive. But the walls were the only sign of life he could find. There was still no evidence of the missing workers or whatever might have gotten them. But then, after D-11424 rounds a corner, he sees that something is up ahead of him. It's not one of the workers. It's a creature, and one that looks like nothing he has ever seen before. The thing crawling on the floor of the cave looks like a giant worm, several feet in length, but with a grotesque, skinless human head. D-11424, frightened at the sight of this grotesque creature, turns to run, but it's too late. The worm has spotted him and charges at him immediately, slithering across the wet cave floor at an incredible speed. D-11424 slips and falls to the ground. His shoulder-mounted camera knocked off his body and left facing a wall, leaving the researchers monitoring the feed with nothing except the sound of his screams. Once contact was lost with the Class D personnel, the Foundation decided that due to the presence of hostile creatures within the cave system, that the next exploratory expedition would be undertaken without humans. The mission was authorized, and two months later, a remote-controlled drone designated A-47 was sent into the cave. Just like D-11424 and the quarry workers before saw, its camera captures passageways opening and closing in the living rock walls. As it progresses deeper, it eventually spots the same worm-like creatures with horrible human faces that look like they've had their skin removed, which have now been designated by the Foundation as SCP-2385-1 entities. And A-47 soon discovers a surprising fact about these bizarre organisms. They appear that they are being birthed right from the walls of the cave itself. As A-47 enters one of those largest rooms yet seen in the cave, its camera captures over a dozen 2385-1s growing out of the walls and ceiling in various stages of maturity. Some of them snap at A-47 as it passes by, trying to attack the drone, but luckily they're unable to reach. There's larger examples of the worms in the room too, and these ones also differ in appearance slightly, with a fibrous growth over their eyes. The researchers assume that these entities are different enough from the smaller versions that they warrant their own classification and are designated as SCP-2385-2 entities. Luckily for A-47, these larger specimens, which can be as large as 4 meters in length, seem much more docile than their smaller counterparts and ignore A-47 as it passes by. A-47 then learns another shocking piece of information about these disturbing worm-like creatures. They're cannibalistic. Its camera relays footage back to the research team of a 2385-1 entity feeding on another, smaller one. It appears that they eat their prey whole after unhinging their grotesque jaws. The one feeding tries to lash out at A-47 with its tail, but can't reach him with half of another instance in its mouth, and the drone continues deeper into the cave. Just when A-47 enters the next chamber, a 2385-1 instance growing out of the ceiling drops down right in front of it, leaving no way for the drone to get around it in the narrow section of cave. A-47 quickly turns around to seek out another path, but its camera captures the passage closing in front of it. A-47 is trapped. The 2385-1 entity charges towards the remote-controlled drone and attacks, biting and slapping it with its powerful tail. It then attempts to consume it, but is unable to ingest the bulky drone and, instead, leaves the heavily damaged robot for dead, slithering away deeper into the cave. The battered drone lies immobile on the cave floor for several hours, its camera broadcasting until the last of its battery is finally about to run out. Just before it stops sending signals back to the research outpost, though, it captures something. The wall next to A-47 opens up, and two of the larger SCP-2385-2 entities emerge from the new passageway. One of them approaches A-47, as the other probes at the wall next to it with its head. It seems as though the larger of the entities are actually able to form new pathways in the cave, or at least open up doorways between existing ones. With the last of its battery power, A-47 sends back a truly remarkable sight. 
out of the hole opened by the 2385-2 entity, appears D11424. He's dirty, disheveled, sporting a month's worth of beard growth, and brandishing a machete. The wall opens up from the Dash 2 entity prodding at it, and the odd group exits through it. It's the last thing A47 transmits back to the Foundation. Two months later, after several more failed manned missions, there was finally a success. An SCP-2385-2 instance that had wandered close to the entrance was retrieved from the cave system and brought back to a Foundation research site where a camera was surgically implanted in its head. The entity, which was designated as Subject Alpha, or SA, was then amnestitized and released back into the 2385 caves, allowing researchers to monitor how it behaved as it traveled through its home environment. The researchers watched as SA made its way through the cave system and stopped in another of the rooms filled with young versions of 2385-1. The larger entity approached several and appeared to nuzzle its face against theirs before moving on, which looked to have a calming effect on the extremely aggressive smaller versions. As it continues through the tunnels, SA sees a group of 2385-1 instances feeding on a deceased 2385-2. It appears that when 2385-1s are unable to swallow their prey whole, they burrow into the body and consume them from the inside out. Luckily, they are too distracted by their meal to pay any attention to SA, and it is able to pass by. SA then runs into two other 2385-2 entities, and the three begin traveling through the caves together. They are soon attacked by a smaller Dash-1. But the group is able to pin the biting and thrashing entity to the ground with their powerful tails, allowing S.A. to nuzzle it. Just like with the ones being birthed from the wall, this seems to calm the creature, but there is another effect as well. As the 2385-1 entity becomes more docile, the same fibrous growths that can be seen on the larger 2385-2 entities start to grow over its eyes. Is this how 2385-2s are created? The group of Dash 2s continues their journey through the tunnels, often stopping to prod at the walls to open new pathways. It appears that they are searching for something, looking around each new room they enter before moving on. Eventually, they run into something, but it doesn't appear to be what they wanted to find. They enter a new section of cave, and blocking the path in front of them is the largest SCP-2385-1 entity yet recorded. It's as big as the Dash 2s at over 7 meters in length and weighing an estimated 400 kilograms. It appears to be extremely hostile, but the Dash 2s seem to instinctively know that the only way forward is to go past this massive Dash 1. The trio nuzzles their heads together as if they are saying one final goodbye before one of the Dash 2s charges straight ahead. The Dash 1 attacks and quickly incapacitates it with its powerful tail and snapping jaws. It begins feeding on the Dash 2, giving SA and its one remaining companion the time they need to get past. As the now duo moves past, the other is attacked from a side tunnel by a group of regular-sized but ferocious Dash 1s. SA can't do anything to help. It seems to pick up the pace and continues on, but as it rounds a corner, it comes face to face with another large Dash 1 instance. It turns down a side tunnel to avoid it, but finds itself in a dead end. It prods at the wall as the Dash 1 rushes towards it, but no new passageways open. It turns around, seemingly resigned to its fate as the Dash 1 begins attacking. But just then, something else appears in the tunnel coming towards them. It's D11424, charging forward with his machete raised in the air, his hair and beard both long and wild. He begins fighting the large Dash 1 entity, hacking at it with his machete until it finally dies. With the vicious entity now dead, he kneels down next to S.A. and begins stroking its head in a calming manner. Hey there, little guy. You all right? He asks as he pets the 2385-2. Yeah, you're fine. Get up. I know where it is. Come with me. S.A. struggles from its injuries, but is able to follow D11424 as he leads it through the tunnels. With D11424 stopping at one point to carve a piece off of the fleshy walls and consume it. The tunnels eventually open up into a large room that looks similar to the rest of the cave system, except there is a huge glowing orb at its center. It's a beautiful sphere of warm light that appears to be at least 10 meters in diameter. Here we are, the D-Class tells S.A. and motions towards the orb. It's all right. S.A. nuzzles against D-11424, perhaps one final thank you for saving its life, then instinctually seems to know what to do. The camera feed shows that it began crawling towards the sphere, and after a brief pause, started pushing itself inside. The camera recorded the brilliant light of the orb engulfing S.A. and its implanted camera before the feed finally cut out. The SCP Foundation would later discover that on that very same day, in the city of Elgin, Illinois, 
A local woman was admitted to the hospital after complaining of abdominal pains. Doctors performed emergency surgery and found something they did not expect. A micro camera had somehow become embedded inside of her body, which upon later investigations would be found to bear the same serial number as the one that had been implanted in SA. Following this strange event, SCP-2385, which had previously been classified as Euclid, was upgraded to Keter. An observation site has been built at the quarry and no further human expeditions are allowed inside. In a bit of good news, sometime later, D-11424 finally emerged from the cave system. He was taken back into SCP Foundation custody and continues engaging in exploratory missions on behalf of the Foundation to this day. A pair of urban explorers are standing in front of a rather creepy looking public school building. One explains to the other that it has been abandoned for years, though no one in the town seems to know exactly why. The two pull a board off one of the windows and climb through. The inside looks pretty much like they were expecting. Their flashlights reveal that years of squatters, teens partying, and wild animals have left plenty of refuse and debris lying around. There are two wings branching off the central portion of the building. They pick one of them to explore and start walking down the hall. As they make their way down past the graffiti-tagged walls, they stop to investigate one of the classrooms. It looks to be in the same bad state as the rest of the building. But incredibly, they're still writing on the chalkboard, as if the teacher stopped in the middle of a lesson and walked out. There's even a shriveled old apple still on the desk. As they exit the classroom back into the hallway, one of them stops. Wasn't the graffiti on the wall different before? Impossible, they must be mistaken. They keep walking and come to a stairwell. Time to explore the upper floors. They head up the stairs to the second floor and poke their head out. Everything looks to be about the same as on the first floor. They go back into the stairwell and start heading up again. It feels like they've been walking up the stairs for a long time, though. They should be all the way at the roof by now. They finally reach a door. It must lead to a taller part of the building they couldn't see from the ground outside. They open the door and see… the second floor again. How could this be? The two look at each other. They have explored a lot of strange abandoned places but nothing has creeped them out like this before. They head back down the stairs, and after only a few steps, they are back on the first floor. Something is really wrong with this place. Maybe it's best if they leave. They start walking back towards the entrance, but one grabs the other and points into a classroom. Isn't this the room they went in before? It has to be. The same apple is on the desk, but the complicated physics lesson has been erased. Now the chalkboard has just a simple phrase written on it. The children used to sing. The two scream and run out of the classroom, but which way is the entrance? The hall appears to stretch on in either direction before turning at 90 degree angles. This isn't right. The entrance was definitely visible from outside the classroom before. They pick a direction and start to run. The hallways seem to go on and on, turning in ways that should double back on themselves, but they still can't find the entrance. They try going back up through a stairwell. But just like before, there appears to be either too many or not enough stairs between the floors. The explorers keep running, checking rooms for a way out. Somehow they keep finding that same room with the rotten apple on the desk. They're panicking now. Every time they look away, the graffiti on the wall changes or a new classroom door appears in the hall. They keep running though, turning corner after corner after corner until… there it is, the entrance. But it's then that one of the explorers realizes… He is all alone. He must have outran his friend. He looks at the entrance. It's so close. He starts to step towards it, but no. He can't leave his friend. He'll find him. He turns around and right in front of him is the same classroom again. The one with the apple. Only this time, his friend is in there, sitting in a desk in the middle of the room, asleep. Gathering the last of his courage, he runs into the room and tries to wake his friend, but he won't come out of his deep sleep. He pulls him out of the desk. If he won't walk out, he'll drag him out. He pulls him out of the classroom and down the hall towards the entrance. They're almost home free. He's just feet away from the door. He reaches out with his free hand and grabs the handle. Locked. He starts banging on the door, terrified that they'll be trapped in this place forever. When suddenly, the doors swing open. Two stern-looking men in suits are standing in front of him. You aren't supposed to be here, one of the men says as the other picks up his friend, throws him over his shoulder, and escorts the both of them out of the school. What these urban explorers didn't know 
is that they had just unintentionally entered a mysterious anomaly that the SCP Foundation has designated SCP-026, a strange location that has been given the nickname After School Retention. SCP-026 is a three-story building that used to be a public school prior to it being shut down and condemned after both staff and students reported various anomalous properties in the building. They described hallways that seemed to change in length, classrooms disappearing and reappearing, and stairways with different numbers of steps leading up and down. The discrepancies between the building's blueprints and the reported interior were strange enough, but the former school truly came onto the Foundation's radar after the disappearances of multiple people in the area were linked to the location. It was initially believed, after sending in robots equipped with video equipment to explore the school, that the spatial anomalies were actually caused by an anomalous mental effect the space was having on people's perception, and that the physical layout of the school was not actually changing. However, additional exploration has proven that this is not the case. The physical space of the school does in fact seem to change, and even the exploration robots are affected by this shifting geometry. The inside of the school is covered in a substantial amount of graffiti, and most of it is the type you'd expect to see in any abandoned space – gang signs, names, and street art, for example. But it appears to fade in and out and will change location. The writing on the chalkboards in the classroom appears to do the same, and just like the graffiti, much of what is written on the chalkboards is what you would expect to find in a school. Most of the writing relates to basic subjects like math, literature, and biology. However, some of the subjects that have appeared are highly advanced and out of place in a non-university setting, such as the notes on quantum entanglement that were found on a chalkboard. Bizarrely, the phrase, the children used to sing, has been found multiple times in a variety of places around the building though researchers are still left without an answer as to what it means or what significance it holds. But the anomalous nature of the writing inside of SCP-026 doesn't stop there. The written content of books, notepads, and other pieces of paper brought into the school have been observed to disappear, leaving blank pages behind, only for the writing to reappear as graffiti or on the chalkboards. It is unknown why or how this is happening but those working within SCP-026 are advised to be careful of what written materials they bring inside. Multiple unconscious persons have also been found in the building. Several of the people found in the school have been identified as either former students or faculty of the school, including teachers and janitors, all of whom had been reported missing in the years following the school's closure. Despite some of them disappearing as long as 10 years after the school closed, when they are found inside SCP-026, they appear much younger than they should be, with the majority being high school aged and dressed in the style of the school's dress code in the time before it was shut down. It is currently not known how they ended up inside of SCP-026 or why they present as being a younger version of themselves. Attempts to wake unconscious people while still inside the school are always unsuccessful. However, once they are transported outside of SCP-026, they will immediately awaken. All have displayed signs of confusion in their brief moments of consciousness, before quickly dying from what appears to be severe dehydration. Their bodies will then experience rapid advanced decomposition. No useful information on the nature of SCP-026 has been gleaned from any of these subjects in the brief period after removing them from the school that they are conscious and alive. There have also been several cases of D-Class personnel who had participated in SCP-026 research disappearing from Foundation control, only to be found within the school at a later date. All are found sleeping and experience the same fate as the others who mysteriously appear within the school. The same inability to wake up while inside the school appears to also apply to those who enter SCP-026 and fall asleep, though they do not suffer the same gruesome fate upon being removed from the site and waking. Such was the case for a Foundation agent who, during a routine security check of the site, was found sleeping in the entranceway of the school by his partner. They were unable to wake the agent up, and he was moved outside the building. As soon as he was outside of SCP-026, the agent regained consciousness and appeared to be in a state of extreme agitation. In later interviews, he reported that he had dreamed he was in a strange classroom, and the same dream has been reported by all subjects who have fallen asleep in the school as well as by the D-Class personnel who were later found inside. They all describe that in the dream, they are sitting inside of a classroom that closely resembles those found in SCP-026, though in the dream it is in a condition that matches how it likely appeared while it was still a functioning school. 
The bell rings, but no one moves, and raising their hand does not get the teacher's attention. Everyone is just sitting silently. If they try to leave the classroom, they find the doors locked. They then notice what is really off about the dream. Everything is in black and white, except for the dreamer, who looks down at their own hands and realizes that they are in color. Just as they begin to realize that they are dreaming, and that they are the one who is out of place, they wake up. This dream will persist, recurring over and over, and each time it takes the dreamer longer and longer to realize that they are dreaming. They also notice each time that their hands are a little more gray. Research into SCP-026 is ongoing, and all potential entrances, including both doors and windows, are to remain locked and boarded up in between investigative missions. Alarms have been placed around the location to alert Foundation personnel in the event that civilians or any other unauthorized personnel gain entry to the site. Due to the fact that even with these precautions, people continue to be found within SCP-026, and there has not yet been a reliable way discovered to prevent it, this anomaly has been classified as Euclid. While you do not appear to be at risk of any serious danger if you have not previously fallen asleep in SCP-026, pay attention to your dreams, and if at any time you find yourself back in a classroom setting where things seem, well, off, contact the nearest SCP Foundation personnel to receive Class A amnestics in order to minimize any risk of you experiencing an after-school retention. The girl sighs and slumps in her seat, kicking at the back of the bucket seat in front of her. Her mother, sitting in the car's front passenger side seat, doesn't even notice. She's too busy taking photographs out the window and chattering with her husband, who's driving the car. That's all they've been doing all day, and the girl is sick to death of it. Her parents dragged her on this stupid vacation trip, and now she's got to waste her whole summer away from her friends. She stares out the window and watches the pastoral countryside slide past. The quaint little villages and rolling hillsides really excite her parents, but she could not care less. Mom and Dad planned this family vacation across Europe for months, but she would much rather have gone someplace interesting instead. There are only so many boring old castles and stupid cathedrals that you can look at before you just lose your mind. The girl sighs and crosses her arms across her chest in silent resignation. Guess we're just gonna look at more dumb buildings, she mutters. Honey, can you stop that? Your father worked really hard to put this trip together, and the least you could do is pretend to have a good time," says her mother, momentarily lowering her camera to berate her ungrateful daughter. Huh? It's the first time that her mother has acknowledged her all day. I think you're really gonna like today's itinerary, says her father, grinning as if he's got a delicious secret that he can't wait to share. We know it's been hard for you spending your whole summer away from home, so today we're gonna do something just for you. Uh-huh, says the girl. Sure, Dad. She rolls her eyes and pulls out a cell phone. At least she can still get internet access out here. Desperate for something to distract her from the monotony of this car trip, she quickly scrolls through her feed and reads all the notes that her friends back home are posting. She frowns. Her classmates are all posting about the latest blockbuster film in the girl's favorite media franchise, Vampire Boyfriend. She grits her teeth. She likes to consider herself a Vampire Boyfriend superfan. She's a well-known poster in the Vampire Boyfriend online community, famous for her fanfiction, as well as her own original character, Vampire Girlfriend. In fact, her writing is somewhat controversial. A lot of Vampire Boyfriend purists have accused her character Vampire Girlfriend of being a Mary Sue, and they object to her stories where Vampire Boyfriend meets and falls madly in love with her, to the point that he forgets his canon lover from the film series, Vampire Wife. She's annoyed to see that her friends got to see the new Vampire Boyfriend movie on opening night, while she's stuck out here on this stupid family vacation. The movie won't premiere in Europe for another few months, and there's no way she's going to be able to avoid spoilers for that long. Everything about this situation seems tailor-made to irritate her, and the excited giggles of her parents in the front of the car as they <laughs> exchange knowing glances are only annoying her more. Trust me, you're gonna love this, says her father again. He peers at an unfolded roadmap in his lap, mutters something under his breath, and turns the car off the main highway and onto a narrow gravel road. The girl grits her teeth as the car rattles over the uneven ground so hard that it nearly jostles her cell phone from her grasp. She tries to distract herself by typing some notes to herself, plot points for the latest Vampire Boyfriend fanfiction that she's working on. In her new story, Vampire Girlfriend is going to be kidnapped by werewolves, leading Vampire Boyfriend to have an existential crisis as he struggles to find meaning in a world without his beloved. She makes a note that Vampire Girlfriend should look, dress, and talk just like her. 
After all, she imagines, wouldn't she be the perfect match for a vampire boyfriend? She pauses, a momentary, dreamy expression on her face, as she imagines how much better a weekend together with vampire boyfriend would be compared to this boring car trip. This can't be right, mumbles her father, scanning the horizon. But the directions said. Suddenly he brightens up. Oh, there it is. Playland. The girl cranes her neck to see that the car is fast approaching what appears to be a little carnival at the end of the road. She rolls her eyes. Oh, great. Of course her parents would take her here. First, they bore her with endless visits to museums and historical sites, and now, when they want to make it all up to her, they take her to a carnival for babies. She's not a kid anymore, but her parents still think that this sort of goofy nonsense should excite her. I know you've been bored going to all the historical sites with us, Honey Pumpkin, says her father as he pulls the car into a parking spot and applies the brake. That's why I asked the hotel concierge if there was anything good around here for kids. And wouldn't you know it? The next morning, what did I find shoved under our door? Three free tickets. He holds up the tickets as if they were a trophy he'd won. The girl's mother nods approvingly. Now that's good service. I hope you left him a big tip. The girl groans. You can't be serious, Dad. A carnival? What, do you expect me to ride on the teacups or something? I'm 15. I'm not a dumb baby anymore. Language, young lady, admonishes her mother as she unbuckles her seatbelt. Your father worked really hard to find this place just for you. The least you could do is show a little gratitude for once. Oh, you think you're too old now, says her father. But I bet once we see some of these rides, boy, I'll bet you feel just like a kid again. He inhales deeply. Even inside the car, the unmistakable fair smells of funnel cake and corn dogs are in the air. You smell that? It smells like fun. Sure, fun. The girl pockets her cell phone. The family exits the car and walks toward the Playland gate, where they're greeted by a costumed employee. Welcome to Playland, announces the employee in a chipper voice. Your favorite amusement park. When you're at Playland, you'll find that the worries of the day melt away, and it's time for play. Oh, you speak English, says the father. He turns to the mother. See, now that's service. He hands over the complimentary tickets. The employee takes them with a smile and a flourish, and then ushers the family through the gate. The girl, however, can't stop staring at the gatekeeper. If she didn't know any better, she would think that he was dressed like Vampire Boyfriend. But that doesn't make any sense. It must just be a coincidence. But once they enter the park, she sees that all the employees are dressed like Vampire Boyfriend. The guy standing behind the counter of the ring toss booth, the guy manning the balloon station. The uniform for this park looks like the outfit that she imagined Vampire Boyfriend would be wearing in her first fanfiction story. Wait, says the girl, staring up at the bundle of helium balloons floating above the balloon vendor. Each balloon bears the name Vampire Boyfriend and the fanged bat logo of the film series. So it's not a coincidence at all? This theme park really is themed after her favorite films? Her father notices her change of expression, and he nudges her in the ribs. Eh? Eh? I told you that you like it. This is all about those movies you like so much, huh? Ghost Boyfriend or whatever? It's Vampire Boyfriend, Dad, she says distantly, but she's too mesmerized by her surroundings to put much feeling into the barb. How much for a balloon? asks her father, pulling open his wallet and quickly thumbing through a stack of local currency. Oh, no charge, says the balloon vendor brightly. He plucks a string from the bundle and hands it over. Everything's free for our valued special ticket holders. Well, would you listen to that, says her father. He replaces his wallet in his back pocket. Now, this is the kind of carnival that I wish we had back in the States. The girl awkwardly takes the proffered balloon. She feels silly holding it, but she's more confused about why it's free. The whole point of offering free entry into a carnival is to gouge people with overpriced rides and souvenirs, right? But everywhere she looks, she can't help but notice signs advertising free corn dogs and bumper cars, unlimited rides for zero dollars. How can this carnival make enough money to keep operating if it's not charging for anything? In fact, how can this carnival make enough money to keep operating when it's based around a niche film like Vampire Boyfriend? Are there really that many Vampire Boyfriend fans out here to keep this place in business? Not that there's anyone else around. As she scans her surroundings, she realizes that, while there are plenty of costume employees bustling around the fair, she doesn't see any other fair goers. It's as if this whole carnival was created and maintained solely for her benefit. Hey, Pumpkin, how about a ride? I bet you'd love to try out some bumper cars, huh? Says her father. How about we go for a race and you can see if you can beat your old man, huh? He points to a bumper car ride across the midway. The girl stares. Like all the other rides, it's covered in vampire boyfriend murals. This one depicts a young woman running away from a pack of werewolves, and the young woman looks exactly like the girl. It couldn't be. But there's no other explanation. The young woman in the mural matches exactly the description of the girl's character Vampire Girlfriend from her fanfiction story. 
and the image of the werewolves looks like it's an illustration of the scene where Vampire Girlfriend gets kidnapped. How could this be? Could it be that the artist, obviously a fan of the Vampire Boyfriend films, is also familiar with her fan fiction? But even if that was the case, it's absurd to think that he would use it as an inspiration for a theme park ride. Who other than her would possibly recognize this scene? Hmm, says the girl's mother, walking up behind her and peering at the mural. Why, that girl looks just like you. I know, she does, says the girl quickly. It's almost a relief to know that her mother has also noticed the resemblance. At least it means that she's not imagining things. At the same time, she feels a twinge of guilt. Readers online are always accusing her of using Vampire Girlfriend as a thinly disguised self-insert. Seeing this larger-than-life picture of Vampire Girlfriend makes her think that there might be some merit to the accusation. Come on, you lot, stop worrying about some old picture and let's have some fun, says her father. He offers money to the ticket taker parked behind the kiosk, but the man merely shakes his head. Your money is no good here, sir, says the ticket taker. The bumper cars are free for our favored guests today. Their father clambers into the rink and ambles toward a bumper car. Her mother tugs at the girl's arm as if to encourage her to join in, but the girl resists. Come on, what's gotten into you? says her mother. This place is just weird, says the girl. Like, half of the stuff here isn't even from the official vampire boyfriend lore. It's all stuff that I made up for my stories. Her mother rolls her eyes in annoyance. Really, we go to all this trouble to find something that you would like to do, and all you want to do is complain? I'm sorry, ma'am, is there some problem here? The family is startled as another employee walks up to them. He's also dressed like vampire boyfriend, and a wide smile is plastered across his face. You folks look like you're upset about something. You're damn right I'm upset about something, yells the girl. In her rage, she throws her drink at the employee. He barely reacts as the cup explodes against his chest, dousing him with sticky soda. What's going on here? Where did you hear about Vampire Girlfriend? Ma'am, Playland is designed to give every visitor the perfect experience, says the employee blandly. That's not good enough. Tell me what's going on here. The employee's attitude changes on a dime. His bright smile fades, and suddenly his tone turns stern. Ma'am, I'm afraid that you're going to ruin everyone's fun if you keep up this sort of behavior. We like to keep things fun here at Playland. If you want to spoil the fun, I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to leave. Fine, then we'll leave. Oh, come on, young lady, we just got here, snaps her mother. We literally drove all day to get here and you want to leave after just one ride? You don't even like rides. There's a principle involved here, says her father sternly as he saunters up. Young lady, if that's your attitude, then I think maybe you should go wait in the car, because your mother and I intend to have a good time. The girl doesn't have a chance to argue. The employee rests his hands heavily on her shoulders and turns her around. Don't worry, folks. We'll escort her back to your car. You can join her as well when you're ready. The girl cannot believe what's happening. The employee politely but firmly steers her toward the exit, and Frog marches her out the gate. He abandons her in the parking lot, tipping his hat and smiling brightly before he disappears back inside the park. Please try to enjoy yourself, ma'am, until your parents are ready to join you. In the meantime, why don't you work on that new fanfiction you've been planning? How do you know about that? yells the girl. The employee doesn't answer, simply turning and fading back into the crowd. She rushes to the gate, but the gatekeeper stops her. Sorry, ma'am, no re-entry without a ticket. But I have a ticket, she cries. You saw it, my dad gave it to you like half an hour ago. Come on, you can't be serious. She tries to push past him, but the gatekeeper grabs her wrists with surprising strength and holds her. Still smiling, he firmly escorts her back out to her car before releasing her. Please, ma'am, don't make a scene. You're going to disturb our guests. Who's in charge here? I, I need to talk to the manager. I want my parents back right now. The gatekeeper doesn't even respond. He simply returns to his station. There's nothing that the girl can do now but wait. She sits down in the gravel and leans her back against the side of the car. Minutes turn to hours, and still her parents haven't returned. Eventually, she goes back to yell at the gatekeeper again. Where are my parents? They should have been back hours ago. Sorry, ma'am. I guess your parents are just having too much fun right now. I'm sure you'll see them again soon, though, says the gatekeeper. The girl shivers as she feels a bite in the cool twilight air. She notices that the sun is starting to dip behind the mountains. It'll be dark soon. How much longer could they take? Even if they decided to ride on every ride in the park, surely they would be done by now. What time does the park close? Asks the girl, a note of panic rising in her voice. The gatekeeper blinks serenely. Playland is open 24-7, ma'am. We're always here when you want to play. The girl feels the color drain from her face as she ponders the possibilities. Her father has the car keys, so she can't take the car to go for help. She pulls out her cell phone, but she doesn't know the number she would need to alert any local authorities. 
and it's not like she speaks the language anyway. Other than the employees here at Plainland, she hasn't met a single person in this whole trip who speaks English. She's completely helpless, trapped, and there's nothing that she can do except wait and hope. As the night settles in, she realizes that her wait might have just started. <laughs> it might not be the happiest place on Earth, but it definitely tries to be. And while the world is full of sketchy amusement parks, most of them just want your money. The amusement park known as SCP-1357, however, genuinely wants you to have a good time. Sometimes it wants you to have a good time, whether you want to or not. SCP-1357 is a theme park with an area of approximately 4 square kilometers, located somewhere in Poland. The park has four entrances, at each of the cardinal directions. SCP-1357 is highly selective about who it allows to enter the park, restricting access to parties that meet the following criteria. The group must contain at least two adults in a romantic relationship. It must contain at least one member who is under the age of 18 and who thinks of the aforementioned romantic couple as their guardians. And every member of the party must possess a free ticket, hereafter referred to as SCP-1357-B. The park does not charge for admission, and the only way to gain access is to have possession of an instance of SCP-1357-B. Once inside, SCP-1357 looks like any other carnival, with thrill rides, amusement arcades, midway games, and concession booths. Highly unusual for a carnival, though, is that SCP-1357 does not accept any money. All rides, food, and souvenirs are free. The layout and theme of the park are different for different visitors and appear to be highly contingent on the desires of the youngest member of any visiting party. Often, the park will appear themed after various popular media properties, such as Batman, Winnie the Pooh, or Barney the Dinosaur. However, visiting parties accompanied by more imaginative kids may encounter substantially weirder things in the park, including talking animals, sentient foodstuffs, temporal displacements, and even extra-dimensional portals. Although the park normally sits empty, when a group meeting entry requirements arrive at the gate, SCP-1357 will spontaneously manifest a full working staff, people designated as SCP-1357-A. Instances of SCP-1357-A appear to be ordinary humans of various ages, ethnicities, sexes, and genders, all clothed in matching uniforms, suggesting that they are employees of the park. Instances of SCP-1357-A are exceptionally friendly and helpful and are extremely dedicated to making sure that visitors to SCP-1357 have a good time. In fact, there's nothing that they care about more. There is, however, a darker side to SCP-1357, and one incident suggests the frightening lengths to which the park will go to make sure that its younger visitors truly enjoy their stay. As part of an experiment, a Foundation agent visited the park with his own family, each member equipped with audio recording devices that continuously transmitted to Foundation consoles. During his stay, he attempted to interrogate an instance of SCP-1357-A. The instance of SCP-1357-A refused to answer the agent's questions about the purpose or origin of the park, instead lamenting that the agent's attitude was going to spoil the fun for his family. Eventually, instances of SCP-1357-A escorted the agent to an exit and forcibly removed him from the park. When his wife attempted to follow him, the couple's daughter refused to leave. Instances of SCP-1357-A separated the daughter from her family, removing the wife from the park and keeping the daughter inside, leaving the parents with only vague assurances that their daughter would be returned when she was ready to leave the park. Attempts to forcibly recover the daughter proved futile, and even a well-armed rescue team was unable to overcome the seemingly infinite numbers of SCP-1357-A that SCP-1357 manifested to protect itself. Hopes that SCP-1357 might indeed allow the daughter to leave when she became bored with the park attractions also proved to be futile. Audio captured from the daughter's recording device seems to indicate that when she eventually demanded that SCP-1357-As release her, she was instead placed into some sort of machine that altered or brainwashed her into becoming an SCP-1357-A herself. Subsequent park visits by Foundation researchers have revealed a new SCP-1357-A that matches the daughter's physical description but does not display any memories of her past life. Interactions with the SCP-1357-A that resembles the missing daughter reveal that, like other instances of SCP-1357-A, her only thoughts are on how to please park visitors and help them enjoy a pleasant visiting experience. In the end, Playland may offer the ultimate amusement park experience for free but it might still exact a price that's way too high. A prisoner in a striped uniform is led down the central corridor of a penitentiary by a pair of guards. Wherever he's being taken, 
the prisoner is not going peacefully. The other inmates stand at their cell doors watching as he is dragged past them. The prisoner is begging for the guards to show him mercy, pleading for them not to make him go in there, to subject him to anything, anything in the world, but that. The guards pay no attention to his cries as they force him along. They reach the end of the corridor and stop in front of the last cell, number 667. The prisoner looks into the dark, empty cell and screams, struggling against his captors one last time before they overpower him and shove him inside, slamming the door shut behind him. The prisoner looks around the small, dim cell. All that's inside is a bed with a thin mattress and a filthy toilet. He looks extremely scared, his eyes searching around the cell as if a monster is going to leap out from a dark corner and grab him. The prisoner hears a cracking sound and jumps in fright, spinning around to see a different kind of monster. Standing between the two guards who led him here is a third prison guard. He's enormous, and the prisoner watches as he cracks the knuckles of his massive hands. The giant guard reaches for something hanging next to the cell door. It's a uh, clipboard. He looks at the prisoner's uniform and notes his name before writing it down. The large guard asks over his shoulder, So, what are we thinking? One day? Two? For this one? One of the other guards answers. He deserves a lot more than that for what he did. Why, what'd he do? Asks the big one. He attacked one of the nurses. She's in pretty bad shape. One of the nurses? The veins in the larger guard's head start to bulge out as his grip on the pencil tightens. Who was it? It was... it was Gloria, the guard answers. The pencil snaps in the giant guard's hand. One of the guards quickly picks it up and hands it back to him. Through gritted teeth, he answers, I see. As the giant guard stares at him with angry, violent eyes, the prisoner starts to slink back into the dark cell, terrified of what's going to happen to him. You like to attack nurses, do you? Well, we're going to give you plenty of time to think about that. I'll see you in a year. The two other guards look at each other, clearly thinking that this is extreme even for a crime like this. Are you sure that's a good idea? One of them asks. But it's already too late. The guard has penciled in the date for exactly one year later. No, please no! The prisoner screams, rushing towards the bars and reaching out as if it will somehow help him. But it doesn't. There's a faint rustling of wind that seems to carry the sound of whispers, and then the prisoner vanishes. He's simply gone, blinked out of existence. The guard hangs the clipboard back on the wall before turning and quickly walking away. He needs to get to the infirmary. The two guards can do nothing but shrug at each other and follow after him. Poor guy, one of them whispers as they walk away from the empty cell. One year to the day later, the huge guard walks down the same prison corridor. It's late at night. And as he walks along, he lets his baton hit against the bars of the cells, making a loud clatter. Wake up, everyone, wake up. It's a homecoming day. Sleepy prisoners get up out of their beds and stand at the front of their cells, trying their best to look through the bars to see the cell at the end of the block. See what happens when you mess with staff? Come on, get up, get up, today's the day. It's a homecoming. The guard gets to the end of the corridor and stops in front of the empty cell with the clipboard hanging on the wall next to it. The door is open, and there's nothing inside the dark cell except for the same dirty toilet and bed. The guard takes out his pocket watch and checks the time. Everyone, the guard and the prisoners alike, are all focused on the empty cell. The guard checks his watch again. The minute hand ticks over to midnight, and the moment it does, the cell door slides shut and locks with a loud click. The prison is completely silent, each inmate waiting with bated breath to see what happens next. The guard takes out a large, heavy ring of keys and inserts one into the cell door before stepping inside. He looks around, and still it appears that nothing inside is different. But then he spots what he's looking for. There in the corner, near the toilet, is a huddled figure in a striped prison uniform. Well, 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 there you are. The guard starts to walk towards this person who has somehow appeared in the cell, but the huddled figure doesn't move or react in any way. The guard reaches down and puts a hand on the man to flip him over. How'd you enjoy your stay? Solitary confinement is one of the most brutal forms of punishment that is still in use across much of the world today. The psychological and physical distress that comes from days, weeks, months, even sometimes years spent alone can be devastating. But as horrible as this practice is, there exists a form of retribution that is even more terrifying. One that even the most hardened of criminals fear and would do anything to avoid. 
This is SCP-2701, also known as True Solitary. SCP-2701 is a seemingly standard-looking prison cell located in a now-condemned Pennsylvania State Penitentiary. The prison, which was built in the early mid-1800s, was showing its age long before it was finally shut down, and the cell contains only an old toilet and bed, with a clipboard hanging to the left of the cell with various forms marked as intake. The cell's construction materials appear normal, and the contents themselves are non-anomalous. It is only when someone is placed inside of SCP-2701 and the clipboard next to the cell is used that its frightening effects become evident. When a human being is locked within the cell, their name is written on the intake form and a date is filled in under the Release Date section, SCP-2701's anomalous activation event is put in motion. Thirteen seconds after these conditions have been met, the person inside will disappear, completely vanishing from view as if they simply no longer exist. Any attempts to better understand the process by which they dematerialize have been unsuccessful, as all recording equipment looking into or placed inside the cell will show only static or blank images during the 13 seconds before the subject disappears. Researchers observing the effect in person, though, have reported the sounds of wind and unidentified whispering voices, but it is still unknown what may be producing these. At 12 o'clock AM on the dot on the release date, the cell's door will somehow close and lock itself if it is not already shut. At this exact moment, the person who vanished will reappear within the locked cell. Unfortunately for the person who was locked inside, while they may have returned to our reality, it is unlikely that they will ever be the same. Experiments into SCP-2701 have revealed that those who are placed inside and vanish will experience a state of complete sensory deprivation while remaining fully conscious the entire time. They experience no sounds, smells, or sense of touching anything. They do not even see darkness, since that would imply sight. Instead, they truly experience no senses at all. This effect can be disastrous for the human psyche, with subjects reporting that they have developed intense fears of both shadows and light, claustrophobia, agoraphobia, and a fear of going to sleep following their time within SCP-2701. At the same time, they will have experienced no physical changes at all, including aging, no matter how much time has passed. But the worst part of SCP-2701 is that those who are locked inside do not experience time at the same rate as you or I. No tests have revealed that once someone disappears from within the cell, they will feel as if time has been significantly stretched out, with the dilation effect causing them to perceive time at a rate that has been estimated to be between 3 and 400 times longer than normal. That means that someone placed inside for two hours will experience time as if they had been locked away for 25 to 33 days, while someone placed inside for a whole year will feel as though they have been floating in a void of nothingness for several centuries. Foundation researchers have theorized that the absence of any outside stimulation for that long of a period causes the mind to break down rational thought structures in an effort to mitigate stress and that a complete psychological breakdown soon follows. In order to better understand the effects of SCP-2701, the SCP Foundation embarked on a number of tests using Class D personnel. In one experiment, which was performed on a D-Class known as D-77391, the event started at 11.45 pm and the release date was set for the coming midnight. This led to the D-Class being inside the cell for 15 minutes, though they experienced their time within as having lasted 75 to 100 hours. When D-77391 was interviewed six hours after reappearing, they described their time inside as being a true hell. Experiencing nothing but emptiness, they couldn't do anything. They couldn't sleep. They couldn't even scream. They were left alone with only their thoughts and memories. The only thing that kept them from completely losing their mind was something one of the researchers told them before they entered the cell. The researcher told them that no matter what they felt, that they had to hold on to the idea that they were going to come back they needed to remember they wouldn't be in there forever. While these words of encouragement did seem to stave off the worst of the mental effects D-77391 could have suffered, they also impacted the results of the experiment, and the offending researcher was later reassigned to a different project, following a six-month suspension. The SCP Foundation first became aware of SCP-2701 following reports of certain abnormalities at a Pennsylvania State Penitentiary. There were numerous complaints by lawyers that they were not being allowed to meet with their clients and that they were being denied access to the site by the prison's warden. When police were finally dispatched to the site to investigate, 
it was discovered that the entire prison, which previously housed 137 inmates and employed a number of staff, had only one inhabitant, the warden. He described the activation procedure for cell 667 and explained that he had placed every single prisoner inside, one by one, and made them disappear. He had been keeping the funds that were supposed to be used for the care of the inmates, as well as to bribe officials and former staff in order to keep the warden's scheme secret and prevent any official inquiries. The warden surrendered to the police without incident, and an undercover foundation agent within the Philadelphia police soon alerted SCP agents to the cell's anomalous effects. When a foundation team arrived on site, they found the cell exactly as described, along with the intake forms. The prison warden had been telling the truth. Over a hundred forms were filled out with inmates' names, with release dates ranging from 50 to over 1300 years in the future. The ease with which SCP-2701 is able to be contained has led to it receiving the safe classification. The former prison where SCP-2701 is located is monitored at all times by video and audio surveillance, and a security guard equipped with full-body restraints is present at all times to both detain any subjects who appear within the cell, as well as prevent any new ones from being placed inside, that aren't a part of an official SCP Foundation experiment. A construction worker puts the final nail into the wall of the room he's working on. He stands up and admires his work. This is going to be a beautiful hotel one day. A true triumph for not just him, but the entire country. And he's proud that he got to play a small part in its construction. He starts to pack up his tools. There's plenty more rooms that need work. It's a massive structure that will ultimately hold thousands. What a modern marvel. As he finishes putting away his tools, he notices something. Through the still doorless frame, he sees someone walk by in the hallway. Normally, he wouldn't think anything of it. There's plenty of other people working on this floor of the hotel, but there's something about this woman. Could it be? No, it's not possible. He takes out his wallet and opens it. Inside is a faded photograph of the construction worker when he was still a young man, barely more than a boy, really. Standing next to him in the picture is the most beautiful woman he had ever known. She was his first true friend, his best friend, and he always hoped that maybe it would turn into something more. They grew up together, shared so many experiences, but then ultimately they were separated and lost touch. He was never able to find her again, but as the picture in his wallet shows, he never stopped thinking about her. Could it really be her though? He runs into the hallway and calls out. The woman stops at the end of the hallway and turns around. She's carrying a tall stack of boxes that are blocking her face. She sets them down and he sees that it really is her. They run towards each other, laughing like children, like the way they used to, and embrace in the middle of the hall. He can't believe it. It's been so many years. He never thought he would see her again. How long has it been? Too long, she tells him. He can't believe how little she's changed. The years have hardly taken any toll on her. She's just as lovely and beautiful as that last day he saw her. He asks her where she's been, what she's been doing. Is she married? She tells him no, and then after they lost touch, she feels like she has just been looking for him, waiting for the day she would randomly see him pass by on the street so that they could reconnect. She just never thought it would happen that they'd be working in the same place at the same time. The construction worker can't believe it either. They both start to ask each other something at the same time, but then stop and laugh at speaking over each other. You go first, he tells her. No, you, she responds with a laugh. Just then, they're both interrupted by the sound of a whistle. The work is finished for the day. That's the signal to pack up and go home. The construction worker tells her to wait there. He just has to go grab his tools and then the two of them can go down together. But as he turns to leave, she reaches out and grabs his hand. Wait, she tells him. He stops and turns back to her. It's okay, he tells her. I'll be right back. But she doesn't seem to want to let go of his hand. Please, not yet, she tells him. I just want you to stay with me. He looks down at his hand. She's gripping him so tight that it starts to hurt a little. Really, I'll just be a second, he tells her. Then we can go somewhere and catch up. But still, she won't let go of his hand. I need you, she tells him. She steps close to him, pressing her body against his. She closes her eyes and opens her mouth, and he feels himself doing the same. I've always needed you, she says as their mouths are about to meet. I need you forever. The construction worker screams as the tiny tendrils emerge from the woman's body and plunge into his flesh. He opens his eyes to see the girl he once knew morphing into a writhing mass of fibers, each reaching out towards him. A long tentacle-like appendage wraps itself around his legs before whipping up and around his body, constraining him as a second tentacle wraps around his head, stifling his screams before popping his head off of his body. North Korea. 
It's a country that's shrouded in mystery, whose government, culture, and day-to-day -day life is a black box to many foreigners. But there's another secret inside, one that even the SCP Foundation is desperate to get to the bottom of, one that they know as SCP-031. SCP-031 is a massive organism, estimated to weigh more than 7,500 kilograms, that can currently be found in a very surprising location, the Ryugyong Hotel, which is located in Pyongyang, the capital of Democratic People's Republic of Korea. The giant creature lives within the ductwork and maintenance infrastructure of the building, where it has spread to all 105 floors of the hotel. Each of its many tendrils ends in a pod-like growth called a sporocarp, which are approximately 2 meters in length and covered in many cilia-like structures. Subjects have reported that when in the presence of these sporocarp, they don't see them as the writhing mass of organic matter that they really are, but rather as an individual from their past, often with one whom they shared an intense emotional attachment. When taking this form, the sporocarp will try to convince the subject to remain with them for an extended period of time. The sporocarp will then attempt to make physical contact with the subject, and if successful, its cilia-like structures will begin injecting digestive juices directly into the subject. This will lead to the start of a process that will eventually cause their flesh to be broken down, consumed, and then incorporated into SCP-031's body mass. Unfortunately for the victim, this horrific process does not kill them. At the same time they are being digested, a flagellum, which is a tentacle-like appendage, will emerge from the sporocarp and wrap around the subject's head. This flagellum has its own set of tiny tendrils that penetrate the cranial cavity and replace the victim's brain's blood vessels, which has the effect of keeping the brain alive and functioning. The head is then removed from the body, and the brain is transported to the central mass of the SCP-031 organism, where it too is incorporated into the creature. It is estimated by Foundation researchers that SCP-031's mass contains thousands of such brains, and by all appearances, they are still alive and conscious. The Foundation first became aware of SCP-031 in 1948, following reports of police activity in North Korea at a location where multiple citizens had gathered near a refugee camp. Those gathered were proclaiming their love for a cult-like leader they referred to as the Beloved. The civilians were able to be calmed through the use of gas-based tranquilizers and amnestics by Mobile Task Force Psi-7, who then recovered a mass that would later be known as SCP-031 and secured it at a local containment site. The SCP-031 creature only weighed 75 kilograms at this time and still had a vaguely human shape. It did not seem to be able to incorporate other matter into its form at this point either, nor could it take on other people's forms with its only anomalous effect seeming to be its ability to inspire intense feelings of love and devotion. The breakout of the Korean War in 1950 led to the destruction of the Foundation containment site, and all anomalies housed there escaped. Following the end of the war in 1953, all of the escaped anomalies were accounted for, all except SCP-031, which was presumed dead. Little more thought was given to the terminated anomaly until 1992, when the SCP Foundation caught wind of reports describing numerous fatalities involving workers at the Ryugyong Hotel. A mobile task force was sent to the hotel to investigate further, but after none of the members returned from the mission, the hotel was locked down and all construction was halted until further notice. By 2008, the increased infestation of the still windowless hotel led to local officials starting construction again to finish the building's exterior and hopefully hide the presence of SCP-031 within, which led to the deaths of even more workers. It's estimated that at its peak infestation, more than 75% of the hotel's 3,000 rooms were infested by SCP-031, but reclamation efforts have been able to reduce that number substantially. Flame projecting equipment is able to destroy SCP-031 tendrils and sporocarps, as well as any personnel who have become assimilated into SCP-031. Reclamation efforts are ongoing, and local officials continue to work with the SCP Foundation to facilitate the ultimate containment or neutralization of the entity. But there's one more strange twist to this story. The more astute SCP experts may have noticed the similarities to SCP-1427, a large slab of beryllium bronze with mind-altering effects that is also located within the Ryugyong Hotel. How is it that two anomalies, both of which strongly impact the human brain, are both somehow housed at the same location? Some clues exist in the form of a classified communication chain between two senior members of Foundation staff. The two discuss the obvious discrepancies that exist when there are records of two anomalies both existing at the same place at the same time, with neither file referencing the other. It leads to a strange paradox where, for one to exist, the other isn't able to, and yet they both do exist. 
Team sent to investigate SCP-1427 will find SCP-1427, and Team sent to investigate SCP-031 will find SCP-031. And yet the first team will have no memory of seeing SCP-031 and vice versa. When the teams were sent at the same time, they were unable to find each other, as if they were existing in parallel dimensions, each with its own version of the Ryugyong Hotel housing its own version of an SCP classified anomaly. Do both anomalies exist? Or perhaps neither of them do? Are both SCPs in fact the result of a third, as yet unknown anomaly? The answer to that question remains unknown, at least to the two senior members of the staff who were communicating about the contradictory files. Both were relieved of their duties under well, suspicious circumstances. And for the time being, both files continue to exist in the database, just as both anomalies seem to exist in the Ryugyong Hotel. For now, this Euclid-class anomaly continues to be contained as well as it can be within the ducts and maintenance shafts of the hotel's central spire. The three secondary spires each contain a Type 9 Heaven's Blade restriction system that focuses a disruptive energy field towards the central spire. This system prevents SCP-031 psychic energies from escaping the structure and affecting any off-site personnel, as North Korean teams continue to push back against the spreading tendrils in the hopes that one day they will finally be able to open the hotel. Three SCP Foundation agents stand before a large warehouse. Their mission is simple. Enter the building, find the observation unit that has gone missing inside, recover the data from it, and leave. It should be easy but the rundown structure they're standing in front of is no ordinary building. This is SCP-015. The leader of the group, a large muscled man who goes by the codename of Agent 6, slides open a large door on the front of the warehouse, and immediately the whole group is struck by a sight that makes them reconsider just how easy this mission is going to be. In front of them is not a wide open warehouse floor, but a cramped tunnel leading deeper into the building. The group has a job to do though, and so the three head inside, Agent 2 first, followed by Agent Lon, the data specialist, and finally, Agent 6, the expedition leader in the rear. As they enter the narrow hall of pipes, the light from their flashlights plays off the floor, walls, and ceiling. Flashlights are one of the only items allowed in SCP-015, and they reveal what the researchers had told them in their briefing, that many of the pipes aren't made of standard materials, but instead are all sorts of strange substances like wood, glass, or even bone. The odd series of pipes have formed a twisting tunnel leading deeper into the warehouse. The group must be careful, since the floor is uneven, with pipes occasionally sticking up out of the floor like tree roots, ready to trip the unobservant. The three follow the corridors of pipes along the path that they each had to memorize. As they come to branching paths, Agent 2 speaks the series of turns they must take aloud. Left, left, right left, right, right again, straight, right, and so on as they go deeper and deeper. They'd have to follow the directions exactly if they hoped to reach the place where the modular robotic vehicle should be. Left, straight, straight again, right, just a couple more turns and they'd reach the point where the MRV had sent its last signal before going offline. As they walk though, they find that some of the passageways are getting more difficult to pass. The pipes have closed in at certain points, choking the already small tunnels down to mere crawlways. At one particularly narrow point, the group must get down on their bellies and pull themselves along the ground. After Lon and Two exit the tight passage, Agent Six suddenly calls out to the two agents ahead of him. What is it? What's wrong? Two asks. I'm stuck, comes the response from Six. Lon and Two grab Six's arms and begin pulling. With a loud grunt from all of them, Six finally comes free. His pant leg is shredded from the thorny wood that one of the pipes in the narrow tunnel is made from, but he's free, and they can continue on. Finally, after what seemed like an hour of walking, they finally find it. The modular robotic vehicle that had been sent in to investigate the current state of SCP-015. There's something very strange about the robot's condition though. It looks like it has been speared right through its primary observation unit. A smooth black pipe that appeared to be made of dark fabric had pierced the vehicle right through its camera, but the lens didn't appear broken. Instead, it looked as if the pipe had somehow connected with it, docking inside the lens housing as if the two parts were made for each other. Other pipes had protruded from the floors and walls as well, snaking into open spots on the vehicle and lifting it up a foot off the ground. They looked over the robot which was held helpless in the air, its wheels slowly spinning as its internal battery ran down. 
The agents walked around the MRV, examining it, looking confused about the fate that had befallen it. Six suddenly broke the silence. Well, what are you waiting for? Lon wasn't sure what to do, though. As she got closer to the robot, she noticed that a foul-smelling substance was dripping from the pipe that had merged with the camera. Her job was to remove the data from the MRV, but they also had strict orders not to damage anything in SCP-015. So what was she to do about the robot? Wasn't it technically a part of SCP-015 now? She was worried that if she removed the data cards, then SCP-015 might… well, she didn't know exactly. Six didn't buy it, though. The researchers may have told them that 015 reacts, but he could see now that it's just a bunch of weird pipes. Maybe it grows or moves a bit, but how would it even know they were there? It hadn't shown any signs of sentience, let alone sapience. He wasn't going to hang around in here any longer than he had to, though, and if Lon wouldn't get on with it, then he would. Six moves to the MRV and flips open the data cover on its side. More of the fetid liquid pours out, but he ignores it. Lon and Two both look at each other. Did the other hear that too? It sounded like steam venting from somewhere deep inside SCP-015. Six doesn't seem to have heard it, and begins to remove the thin data cards from the MRV. With the data now recovered, he decides to see if he could free the vehicle from the pipes. It wasn't necessarily a mission objective, but why let good Foundation property go to waste when it's right here in front of them? Six pulls first at the MRV, then the pipes that were running into it, but he can't get it to move. It's completely stuck, seemingly fused to the pipes. Come on, we've got the data, let's get out of here, Two says. But Six isn't done trying. He sets his flashlight down and uses both hands, pushing against the wall of pipes with his foot to gain additional leverage, when suddenly, there's a creaking sound. Ha! I think I got it! But Six was mistaken. It wasn't the sound of the MRV coming free that he had heard, but the sound of the floor underneath him giving way. Six falls into the floor up to his armpits, and the other two agents rush to help him. But as they do, they notice the glow and immediate burst of heat coming from the hole. Thickly flowing molten glass begins to fill the hole, and Agent Six cries for help as they desperately try to pull him free. His cries turn into screams of desperation as they each grab an arm and, after a struggle, finally manage to free him and drag him from the hole. Six is no longer screaming as he is pulled free, though. His eyes and mouth are locked wide in sheer panic. Lon is now the one who starts to scream, as she realizes that they have pulled only the top half of Agent Six from the hole above the fiery pit. The bottom half of his body is completely gone, burned away by the heat of the liquid glass. There's no time to be shocked, though, because pipes begin to hiss and ping all around them. A wooden pipe above Two and Lon suddenly bursts, sending a cloud of dust flying into their faces. It's powdered glass, and it starts to pour out of the broken pipe, covering what's left of Six completely. Two spits out a thick stream of blood, his mouth shredded from the glass particles, as Lon desperately tries not to rub them deeper into the cuts in her eyes. They both know they can't stay here, though. They have to run. The pipes are deafening as they move as quickly as they can back the way they came. It sounds like a train is barreling through the building. They're surrounded by chaos. Boiling chemicals pour out of one pipe, tiny slicing rose thorns spray out of another. They come to a crawlway that's just a couple feet wide, but it's their only way forward, and they have no choice but to enter. Two dives in and starts crawling. Lon is hesitant, but a blast of steam from a pipe near her head convinces her she has no choice, and she follows after him. Two wriggles through the narrow passage and is surrounded by more sounds of pipes creaking all around him. Each one seems like it might burst and pour who knows what deadly substance onto him, but he has to suppress his fear and keep moving forward. Finally, he emerges into a wider hallway. He turns and looks back at the hole. Lon should have been right behind him, but there's no sign of her. He sticks his head back in and calls for her. There's no response, but he can hear her still in there, somewhere in the dark, struggling. He has to help her. Two gets back into the passage and starts crawling. She couldn't have been that far behind him, probably just around the next turn. But as he crawls around the bend, there's nothing there. Just another wall of pipes. The passage has been sealed up. It's a dead end. He presses his ear to the wall and can hear Lon screaming on the other side. He hits his flashlight against the pipes in anger. The pipe shakes for a moment, then bursts, spraying out a black liquid that covers his hand. It's some kind of corrosive acid, and he screams as it burns through his gloves to the flesh beneath. He quickly crawls backwards out of the narrow tunnel and emerges back out into the wider passage. Chu cradles his hand, trying not to look at the exposed bone. I'm sorry, 
he cries as he runs through the tunnel of pipes towards what he hopes is the exit. I'll get help. I'll come back, I swear. Lon can't hear his promises, though. She heard what she thought was a pipe burst followed by Two's cries, but she doesn't know now if he's dead or alive. She decides she has no choice but to go back the way she came. Maybe there's another way out. But after moving just a few inches, her feet touch a solid wall. She's trapped in a space no bigger than a coffin. She feels around, but there's nothing here in the dark. Nothing at all. Just smooth, fuzzy, warm pipes. No way. There is something. A gap in the ceiling. But it's just the open end of another pipe. And now, there's something dripping out of it. Droplets of whatever the substance is land on her face, and then a full stream of liquid pours out onto her. She coughs as it gets into her mouth, but then realizes that it's sweet. It's honey? At least it wasn't molten glass or deadly acid. Maybe she could even survive for a time on the liquid until another expedition team came to rescue her. Her brief moment of hope is cut short when she realizes that the pipe isn't stopping and that she's already lying in an inch-deep pool of honey. Lon beats on the walls and ceiling as the honey continues to rise around her and screams for help. She tries to plug the pipe with her fingers, but it's no use. Nothing can stop more and more of it from pouring out. The honey continues to rise around her, and all she can do is scream and claw at the pipes that have created her tomb. She presses her lips to the ceiling in an attempt to gain one last breath before the honey completely fills the space. Her final choking gasps are sickly and sweet as the honey fills her lungs. Agent 2 keeps running through the tunnel of pipes. His hand no longer hurts, at least, either from the shock or from the fact that all the nerve endings had been burned away. The horrible sounds coming from the pipes seem to have stopped, too. Maybe he really would make it out of this alive. Lon might have found another way out, too. There's no telling how many routes through this maze of pipes exist. He would probably exit the building to find her outside waiting for him. Poor Agent 6, though. He never had a chance after opening that cover on the MRV. His thoughts are abruptly interrupted, though, when his foot catches on an unseen pipe and he falls forward onto the floor. Or rather, he should have fallen on the floor. Instead, a pit opens up in the ground, leading to a steep, sloping floor of pipes. He screams and tries to stop himself, but the slick liquid covering everything makes it impossible for him to slow his descent, and he begins to slide down the pipes. His dimming flashlight shows what seemed to be an endless tunnel of pipes stretching down into the dark. The tube of pipes twisted this way and that, slamming him into the walls on either side, tumbling him head over feet. And the descent never seemed to end. He screamed until his voice went hoarse, then gave out entirely. He didn't have any way to mark the passage of time, other than when his flashlight finally started to flicker, and then dim, before finally dying. He slid down the endless tunnel of pipes for what felt like days in the darkness, far deeper than they physically should have been able to go. When the friction of the pipes began to tear his skin away, it was almost welcome. At least there would finally be an end. Following the loss of the SCP-015 recovery team, the data on the modular robotic vehicle was deemed non-vital and no further expeditions were authorized in order to try and recover it. SCP-015 is a mass of pipes, vents, boilers, and other various plumbing apparatuses that have completely filled an otherwise nondescript warehouse located in a major American city. Anytime the warehouse is not being directly observed, the pipes will begin to grow, filling nearly all of the available space in the building, but also trying to connect to other nearby structures through the sewer and other subterranean infrastructure systems. The current best estimate of Foundation researchers is that the building contains over 190 kilometers of pipes, which range from just 2.5 centimeters to over 1 meter in diameter. While some of these pipes will look new, Others have the appearance of being rusted or damaged, with many showing signs of leaking. The pipes are made of a strange assortment of materials as well, including bone, wood, steel, pressed ash, human flesh, glass, and granite. Oddly, no pipes composed of lead, PVC plastic, copper, or any other material one would normally expect to be used for the production of pipes have been found. But by far the strangest anomalous quality of SCP-015 is that it appears to react to aggressors. Should the building detect that the personnel inside of it are carrying tools, or if they make any attempt to either damage or repair any of its pipes, they will trigger an immediate reaction. Pipes near the offending subject will often burst, spraying them with a variety of liquids that have included oil, mercury, rats, a species of insect not yet identified, ground glass, seawater, entrails, and molten iron. More and more pipes will continue to burst around the subject until they either retreat from SCP-015 or are killed. 
SCP-015 was discovered by the Foundation after reports that pipes emanating from a warehouse had mysteriously started to connect to multiple other nearby structures, with no obvious answer for how or why they had suddenly begun emerging from the structure. The pipes were eventually able to be cut back and are now solely within the warehouse once again, but the human cost of containing SCP-015 has been high. And so far, 11 SCP personnel have been killed in their interactions with the anomaly, and an additional 20 are still missing. All of the missing are presumed to also be dead, though there have been reports of banging and screaming coming from within the building that may indicate they are still alive in some form. SCP-015 has been classified as Euclid, and because the building itself is impossible to move, it has been effectively contained on site. The Foundation maintains a gap of at least 2 meters around the warehouse, and no structures are allowed to be built that make contact with the building's outer walls. Should any protrusions from SCP-015 be detected, the pipes are to be immediately capped and sealed. Internal exploration of SCP-015 is permitted with approval from senior staff, but following numerous losses within the site, expedition teams must consist of three members, all of whom are equipped with safety lines and GPS tracking. The teams are not allowed to bring any hand or power tools within the building, nor are they to attempt any repairs or maintenance of any kind while inside. There's no need to enforce these rules though, seeing as SCP-015 appears more than happy to terminate the offenders itself. It's not every day that the SCP Foundation opens a brand new site and appoints a new site director, but today is one of those days. Work is about to begin at Site 41, and a respected senior researcher has been appointed director of the brand new site. He hasn't been told much about it yet, but he knows a few things for certain. Some sort of new, highly volatile anomaly was discovered, a site was constructed around it, and his many years of loyalty to the organization have finally been rewarded with a promotion. As he takes his morning shower, his mind races, turning over the possibilities that this new chapter might bring. Is he up to the potential challenges? Just how dangerous is this new anomaly? What could possibly necessitate the building of a brand new site just to contain it? Whatever it is, these years of securing, containing, and protecting have prepared him. He's seen bizarre creatures, cursed places, and objects that defy the laws of physics. Whatever awaits him in his new position, he can handle it. He rinses the shampoo from his hair, letting his jitters flow down the drain with it, and switches off the water. He climbs out of the shower and turns to the foggy mirror. He sweeps a palm across the glass and meets his reflection's eyes. His serious expression catches him off guard, and he can't help but let his mind wander back to someone else who looked at him that way, with those stony gray eyes such a long time ago. He and his brother had never gotten along. Though they shared the same face, the same hair, and the same eyes, they couldn't have been more different. He was the screw-up, the one who couldn't focus in class and was always bumbling through life like a bull in a china shop. His brother was the golden boy, the star student who could do no wrong. As the boys got older, he tried to climb out of his brother's shadow and tried to live up to their parents' expectations, but anything he did, his brother could do better. He got into a great college, his brother got into Harvard. He got a job, his brother got a more impressive one. He got a Honda, his brother got a Mercedes. He fell in love with a girl, and his brother married her. It seemed like he would never stand on his own, never be anything but the lesser version of a perfect man, a nasty little homunculus who just happened to be wearing the graven image of something greater than himself. On the night of his brother's wedding, the festering resentment had finally come to the surface. He remembers the night in bits and pieces, a harsh word, a fifth drink, a broken champagne glass. His brother said something that went too far, cut too deep. Without thinking, he shoved him just a bit too hard. He watched his brother fall, watched his head hit the corner of the table, and then he was still, silent. He thought about turning himself in, but then another thought crossed his mind. Why ruin two futures at once? His brother was gone, there was no coming back from that. Should he really spend the rest of his life in prison over a tragic mistake? It didn't seem fair. Instead, he planned. For once, he was grateful for the similarities between him and his brother, their handwriting for instance. He forged a note to his brother's new bride, telling her that he couldn't take the pressures of his life anymore. He was leaving, fleeing to Europe to start a new life, with a new name, and leaving all of his old ties behind. Then he packed his brother's body, the one that looked so much like his own, into a suitcase. He drove out into the woods, to a place they had once gotten lost as children, and he buried it so deep, no one would ever find it. He'd never forget how he felt that night, laboring away in the dark forest, face an unpleasant mess of snot and tears, 
the end of his shovel piercing the dirt again and again until he'd made a big enough hole to consign the case that now held his own brother's mangled body. Every shovel full of dirt that he piled back on, hiding his sin, felt heavier than the last. What had he done? What the hell had he done? But by the time the grim deed was concluded, rationalizations had smoothed out the hard edges of his crime. There were a million reasons this was okay. This was justified. It was an accident, of course, that much was clear. But didn't his brother also have it coming, for flaunting his perfect life in his face for all these years? And who was the worthless chunk of dead meat now? The scales were balanced once more. No one would ever know what he did. No one but him, in those moments where he could see his brother in the mirror, reminding him of his greatest shame, no matter how hard he tried to forget. But that moment is long gone. He's back in the present now, grounding himself with a splash of cold water on his face. He shakes off the memories and dresses for the day. It's time to get to work. When he arrives at the facility, he's shocked by what he sees. It's a castle, grand and imposing, even if the years have not been particularly kind to it. The Foundation did not build this structure, though they've set up shop inside now. His reminiscence has made him late, and he hasn't even had a chance to look over his paperwork yet. But when you're a site director, what does it even matter if you're a little late? You're the boss, the head honcho. The party doesn't start until you walk in. Just the thought of it is enough to make his chest swell with pride. He will have to ask someone to fill him in, an eager subordinate who won't mind going over the basics of the new facility and what they are here to study. Like clockwork, a young assistant researcher scurries up to him, holding a clipboard and practically vibrating with energy. She clearly hasn't been working here long. There's still light behind her eyes. He thinks to himself, The things you see here will snuff that out soon enough, my dear. The assistant researcher leads him inside the castle, its guts ripped out and replaced with sleek modern technology. A stone staircase has been swapped out for a row of elevators, marble busts exchanged for security cameras and monitors. They enter one of the elevators, and the assistant presses the button for the lowest possible floor. They are going deep into the bowels of the castle, into the belly of the great beast. With a ding, the doors open, and they step out. The air down here has a peculiar smell, musty and dull, with a sharp metallic tang of dried blood. Along the wall, he can see a row of prison cells, eight of them to be precise, all shut tight. They're rusted and old, they've been here for quite some time. The Foundation didn't put these here. Of course, he realizes with a sinking feeling in his stomach that he can't quite explain, these cells themselves must be the anomaly he's here to supervise the containment of. He should have read the file before arriving, shouldn't have let himself get distracted, then he would know what he's walking into. So here we are, the assistant chirps, startling the man. He had almost forgotten she was standing next to him. Shall I give you the grand tour? She won't last long here with such a chipper attitude, he thinks, but he nods just the same. She walks ahead of him, referring dutifully to her clipboard as she goes. This is the first cell. As you can see, all of them are currently inactive. We'll be performing some tests later, though, and you'll hopefully get to see them in action. It's really something. She continues walking to the second cell. There are a lot of potential applications for this anomaly that, once we understand it, could be incredibly promising. He's only half listening as he trails behind her. As they near the third cell, the assistant glances back at him. I really look forward to working with you, sir. I've heard such great things. He opens his mouth to brush off the praise, to feign humility for her sake. When a sound startles him, the grind of metal against metal, the screech of a long disused door, the third cell is opening on its own. The assistant flips through her notes, growing pale. This isn't supposed to happen. This shouldn't be happening. She stammers, but he barely hears a word. He's staring, transfixed, at the darkness within. There's a rattling sound, like chains being dragged across a stone floor. What is about to be unleashed from this prison? He braces himself, remembering all of the near-death experiences he's faced down in the past. Nothing could prepare him for what finally appears. A pair of iron shackles, attached to lengths of chain, shoot out from the shadows, headed right for him. A shackle clamps suddenly around each of his wrists, the cold metal tight enough to cut off the circulation, digging into his skin. Then, an invisible force on the other end of the chains begins to pull. He fights it, the shackles cutting into him as the assistant screams for help, but his efforts are futile. Whatever wants to pull him closer, whatever is trying to lock him away, it's far stronger than he could ever be. The chains yank him inside the cell, and the door slides shut behind him with a crash. He thinks for just a moment that he can see his brother laughing. Then, he's gone, leaving only an empty cell and a traumatized assistant behind.
Sometimes the sins of the past come back to haunt you, and unfortunately for this particular man, there's no statute of limitations when it comes to SCP-567 or The Dungeon. In case the nickname wasn't clear enough, The Dungeon is not the sort of place you would ever want to be confined. SCP-567 is a series of eight cells located beneath Foundation Site 41. Each cell has a designated number from SCP-567-1 through SCP-567-8. Most of the time, the cells are inactive and indistinguishable from any ordinary prison cell. However, when someone that one of the cells deems to be guilty of a specific offense enters their proximity, the anomalous properties of SCP-567 become abundantly clear. Each cell punishes a specific horrible act. SCP-567-1 targets those who have committed theft. 2. Punishes sexual violence. 3 and 4 punish various types of murder. 5. Punishes adultery. 6 and 7. I'm afraid I can't quite make out what it says. Someone appears to have deliberately scratched out the text in the file. As for SCP-567-8, whatever wrongdoing it chooses to penalize is still unknown, and it is never activated in the entire time the Foundation has known of it. Every other cell is completely empty, but 567-8 contains one single, antique wooden chair in the center of the room, nailed to the floor. The purpose of this chair is unclear. When an individual who has committed one of the aforementioned acts comes within 2.5 meters of their corresponding cell door, a pair of shackles will shoot out from within the cell, seemingly materializing out of nowhere. These shackles will then lock around the individual's wrists and drag them inside, at which point the cell door will slide itself closed and lock, and the prisoner and shackles will disappear. Multiple researchers have compared this anomaly, both in its function and its methodology, to SCP-1002, or Demisers, and SCP-2701, or True Solitary Confinement, which I have discussed at length before. Since the Foundation first contained SCP-567, only two prisoners have ever reappeared after being taken. 68 hours after he was first placed inside SCP-567-3, D-903912 escaped and was found collapsed on the ground just outside Site-41. He died only moments after reappearing, before any medical intervention could take place. An autopsy showed severe injuries, including lacerations, internal bleeding, and burns on his wrists and ankles. The second subject to ever return was D-937122, who was found 157 months after being locked in SCP-567-6. In spite of her injuries, which included head trauma, missing fingers, and the same burn marks on her wrists and ankles, this subject had a great deal more energy and attempted to attack the Foundation personnel that found her. She was subdued by several guards, restrained, and interrogated by an unnamed agent. Thankfully, an audio log of the interview was included in the file, giving us a sense of what transpired. Please state your name, the agent began. D-937122 did not respond. Please state your name, they repeated. Again, no response. The agent sighed heavily and changed tactics. Look, I'm very sorry and I want to help you, but we can't give you medical attention unless you cooperate with us, so please, please state your name for the record. At long last, the D-Class responded with an intense outburst. My name? You want to know my name? Screw my name! There is no name! There is no anything! But, but there is. I escaped. I got the medal off. None of the and here the audio was corrupted to the point where I couldn't understand what was being said. After the interference clears, D-937122 could be heard shouting, I should be free! Let me go! A struggle followed as she attempted to escape custody. The agent then replied in an attempt to calm the D-Class down, I apologize, but now we have the opportunity to... Screw your opportunity! There is no opportunity! There is only escape! You called me a monster, maybe I am one, but the nightmares, they... She briefly broke down into unintelligible mumbling before returning to normal speech. Compared to their crimes, I've done nothing wrong. Nothing at all. I haven't done anything wrong. Nothing. At this point, the D-Class became inconsolable, all coherent speech dissolving into sobs. The agent attempted to calm her down, but she remained hysterical. After several moments of sobbing, the D-Class began to gasp as if she was having difficulty breathing. She clutched her chest and began to go into apparent cardiac arrest. The agent attempted to administer CPR, but it was unsuccessful, and after a few minutes, she was dead. An autopsy was ordered following the interview, which revealed the apparent cause of her death. Her body was covered with tiny punctures, and a toxicology report revealed an unknown poison in her bloodstream. Though only two people have ever emerged from SCP-567, 
they were not the only organic life forms to break out of the dungeon cells. Every so often, the doors of a cell will open and an entity will emerge. These creatures are given the designation SCP-567-9, and they are always aggressive. They do not usually match the description of any existing animal, instead appearing to be some sort of undiscovered creature. Once an instance of SCP-567-9 has escaped its cell, it will attempt to leave the dungeon and attack anything that gets in its way. The first instance of SCP-567-9 observed by the Foundation was a four-limbed creature approximately two meters in length. It walked on all fours that had human-like hands on its front limbs, complete with opposable thumbs and sophisticated enough mobility to operate machinery. It was highly intelligent and used this intellect to take out 14 Foundation operatives before it was contained. The details of SCP-567-9-2 have been stricken from any official documentation. The only thing I can surmise from the file is that nine personnel were killed after it appeared, and one of the agents that helped contain it requested and received psychological counseling for what they experienced during the process. So whatever it was he encountered, it wasn't anything good. During a round of routine testing with SCP-567-4, while the cell door was open, an instance of SCP-567-9 appeared, attacking and killing the researcher leading the tests. The entity was not contained, but after seven casualties, was lured back towards its original cell. At this point, the cell deployed its shackles and the creature was pulled back inside. The most recent instance of SCP-567-9 emerged when the door to SCP-567-7 opened and closed spontaneously. This was spotted on the CCTV footage, but none of the security monitoring the video could see anything leaving the cell. Two weeks later, an agent assigned to the dungeon was found dead in his home, still in bed. The circumstances of his death were virtually identical to those attributed to SCP-966, a nightmarish species of creature known as the Sleep Killer, which I've discussed here on the channel before. When the escaped entity was found in Site-41, it was found to resemble an instance of SCP-966, with only a few variations. It was successfully contained, and the on-site security cameras were upgraded to prepare for future anomalies like it. Though many specifics are missing from the file, including the exact appearances of the creature that emerged from the cells, I have deduced one thing. Wherever SCP-567 is transporting those it deems guilty, it is a prison for monsters of all species. Humans are not the only ones it wishes to hold accountable for their crimes. As I was reading about the dungeon and the various tests involving it, a rather morbid question came to mind. What would happen to a test subject guilty of more than one crime? Which cell would claim them? Well, fortunately for my curiosity, and unfortunately for him, one D-Class found out. D-834200 was used as a human test subject during initial studies of SCP-567. He was placed in front of SCP-567-6 and 7. Almost instantly, the cells rattled open and the shackles shot out to grab him. His left wrist and ankle were ensnared by cell 6, and his right were trapped by cell 7. Then, he was pulled into both cells. Well, part of him was at least. How can I best explain his fate without causing too much distress? Have you ever held a wishbone in your hand at a family dinner while your sibling or cousin held the other side and you both pulled until it broke? It was a bit like that. SCP Foundation Site-41 has been established in the abandoned castle that contains SCP-567 in order to prevent any civilians from coming across it. The entrance to the dungeon is kept sealed at all times, and the doors to each of the cells are monitored via CCTV. If any door is opened without authorization, Task Force Delta-9, also known as HACS, will be deployed to contain the resulting instance of SCP-567-9. If, for any reason, it cannot be contained, the Task Force is permitted to terminate. In order to prevent the unnecessary loss of any personnel, all applicants to join Task Force Delta-9 must have a clean criminal record, have never committed a crime at all, even at the behest of the Foundation, have a strong dedication to the law, and show loyalty to the social contract and the feelings of others. A robust moral compass is considered a vital qualification to work near SCP-567, lest they become simply one more victim added to its long list of tortured penitents. The Foundation has encountered many anomalies over the years that could pose a danger to the organization itself. SCP-567 is no exception. Untold numbers of Foundation operatives have committed terrible acts in the service of the greater good. They have lied, stolen, and even killed in order to protect and contain the secrets locked away in files and behind heavily guarded walls. A great deal of caution should be used when dealing with the dungeon, no matter how justified a person thinks their past sins might be. After all, there's no chance to plead your innocence, and the very prison that plans to hold you is also the judge, jury, and executioner. 
A woman wakes up on a bright sunny morning in Midland, Texas. It's her day off, and she decides she's going to use the time to take care of all the lingering errands she'd been putting off for far too long. She gets dressed, washes her hair, and prepares to pour herself a nice bowl of cereal. But when she opens the refrigerator, she finds… there's no milk. She'll need to see to that immediately. She steps out of her front door and notices a paper on her doormat. She bends down to pick up the pamphlet, which advertises a new supermarket opening in town. And what do you know, there's a coupon for milk attached. What a stroke of good luck! The woman makes her way into town, eager to check out the new grocery store. She parks her car and approaches the building, when suddenly, a stranger is standing right in front of her, carrying a plate of what appear to be free samples. He's dressed like a supermarket employee, but he's built like a soldier, complete with a military crew cut. He smiles and tells her that he actually works for a rival store and points at a building across the street. He's positive that whatever she thinks she can get at this store, she can instead get at the one across the street for a lower cost and higher quality. She can't help but notice the almost unsettling desperation in the salesman's face. Something about his spiel makes her feel like she's in danger. She politely declines his offer, but he continues pitching deals and bargains at her as she makes her way into the safety of the new supermarket. The clean tiles below and the buzzing fluorescent lights above seem so familiar, yet also strangely alien to her. Something about this place is just… wrong. But she needs the milk, so she walks down the aisles, deeper into the store. She hears strange noises and looks over her shoulder. Was the bread aisle always behind her? She could have sworn she just came out of the meat and fish section. Where did they even keep the milk in this place? Every so often there's a strange noise somewhere in the store around her. It sounds almost like footsteps, but not quite. More like claws tapping on the tiles. Is she alone in here? Come to think of it, she can't quite remember seeing anyone else since she came in. There's something so profoundly off about this place, but she just can't put her finger on what. She takes a step forward, and suddenly the floor gives way beneath her. The tiles separate with a whir of mechanized gears as a trap door opens up. In an instant, she's tumbling down into darkness. As she falls, she can see the white light beaming in from above illuminate the edge of something metal and razor sharp. In the store above, the sound of a scream can be heard, and a soft squish of metal piercing flesh, followed by the gurgle of blood, and then the trap door closes. A tinny voice over the PA system comes on and says, Clean up on aisle six? The woman is never seen again after that. What superficially appears to be an independent supermarket in Midland, Texas, actually contains a number of strange and often deadly paranormal secrets, and that doesn't even stop it from being a successful and popular supermarket. But the weirdest part of all? It's all perfectly legal, thank you very much. Welcome to Yeah, We're Totally Going to Sell You This, or as it's known to the SCP Foundation, SCP-4703. The primary anomalous effects surrounding SCP-4703 affect not its customers, but the very legality of its own existence and operations. The anomalies shift laws to make everything that goes on inside legal, no matter how unethical or dangerous. It also often reshapes laws to protect its own interests from outsiders, and anyone who breaks these laws may experience spontaneous attacks from violent animals, the most common of which are vicious lions. Here are a handful of the unethical and dangerous, yet perfectly legal, thank you very much, things that go on within the confines of SCP-4703. The stacks of shelves are mounted on powerful pneumatic actuators that seem to shift and spin of their own accord. While this has the intention of keeping the store varied and stopping customers from leaving, it more often causes serious injury with its sudden movements. Occasionally, these sets of shelves will collide, crushing whatever is stuck between them. If a child becomes lost or separated from their parents while they're inside the store, the child is forcibly detained and the parent or parents can only get their child back by either paying an upfront cost of $47.67 in cash or submitting to have their eyebrows permanently removed with laser follicle surgery. There are also several dozen hidden trap door mechanisms beneath the floor in various parts of the building, each one triggered by some strange and arbitrary condition, such as saying the word Wednesday or by not saying the word Wednesday. The triggers are updated each day and displayed on the store's website in several dead languages, including Latin, Koine Greek, Phoenician, and Punic. Each of these trap doors drops into deep shafts filled with some kind of hazard, such as spikes, glitter, or poisonous snakes. Yes, that's poisonous, not venomous. The snakes are only dangerous when eaten, but victims have reported that they seem incredibly appealing, which makes resisting them rather difficult. 
A section on the far side of the store is marked Starving for Savings and Discounts Ad Bestias, where all the products are fenced off and also marked down by 70% or more. However, the products are guarded by no less than 15 hungry lions. Store-branded fishing rods, telescopic grabbing mechanisms, and drones are available to rent for the explicit purpose of retrieving items remotely, although this will result in far higher costs, so you will have to brave the lions in order to attain those incredible deals. There's also a roughly 5% chance that, after checkout, your cashier will ask you to kiss them on the lips. If you refuse, they'll burn your purchases in front of you, and you won't receive a refund. If you do kiss them, there's a 1 in 3 chance that the cashier will have an anomalous toxin on their lips that will cause you to drop dead instantly. And every day, at an arbitrary time between the hours of 3 p.m. and closing time, the lions will be released from the discount section to roam the store, and only two checkout lines will remain open. All items will be free during this period, but they must be scanned one by one. The SCP Foundation is currently exploring links between SCP-4703 and two other anomalies like SCP-2030 and SCP-1459, the former being the cursed hidden camera show Laugh is Fun, and the latter being a nightmarish vending machine that murders puppies and dispenses a variety of cookies in exchange. So then, if it is so dangerous, why doesn't the SCP Foundation simply block access to yeah, we're totally going to sell you this? Unfortunately, thanks to the anomalous legal effect created by SCP-4703, the Foundation can't just storm in or physically contain the building, so instead, they attempt to divert as many customers away from 4703 as possible. To do this, the Foundation has started a rival supermarket across the street, named Super Competitive Prices LLC. Sheldon M. Katz Esquire is an SCP Foundation lawyer and bureaucromancer a thaumatologist skilled in the art of interfacing with anomalously bureaucratic SCPs, and he is spearheading the Foundation legal team's efforts into combating SCP-4703. Untangling the complex web of legality around SCP-4703 is a full-time job, after all, and in the following memo, Mr. Katz did all he could to articulate the sheer enormity of the problem they're dealing with. He writes, Counteraction of SCP-4703's legal anomalies is a top-level priority for our department and we are making every effort to resolve the matter in a way which minimizes loss of life and economic detriment. We have received a significant number of inquiries regarding the mechanism of SCP-4703's indisputable legality. Unfortunately, there are no easy answers. Law is a human concept. It exists on paper because we write it down. It exists in practice because we enforce it. Generally, we interpret and exercise the law through the scrutiny of semantics, intent, and precedent. Yet, bureaucratic hazards such as SCP-4703 are not necessarily predicated on such things. In fact, the law as most know it has very little to do with the matter. While it's not a perfect comparison, one could say that baseline law is to anomalous law as arithmetic is to algebra. Both are recognized as mathematics, but the latter is more abstract. Imagine that Timmy and Sally each have two apples. If Timmy gives Sally his apples, then Sally should end up with four. But she doesn't. She has ten. How can this be? Sally recounts the apples and reenacts the scenario over and over, but there is no mistake. Two and two make ten. It is an incontrovertible fact. You see, even if anomalies are irrational, they are factual, and it is essential that one accepts this if they wish to develop a countervailing methodology. Once Sally accepts that her four apples have become ten, she reevaluates her radix and decides to recount the apples in base four. Suddenly, the ten apples are one zero apples. One zero is four in base four, which is the appropriate number of apples. Eureka! Sally collects another four apples, bringing the total to twenty, which is two zero, which is eight, which confirms that her new paradigm aligns with the abnormality. Form follows function according to the function of the form, and at last, everything makes sense. Except none of it does, really. A well-behaved reality oughtn't conflate the concrete with the abstract. If you initially perceived a countable sum of 10 apples in base 10, then the equivalent number of apples in base 4 should be 22, since it stands to reason that changing your subjective view of an outcome oughtn't alter the physical materials in the equation. However, we live in a very naughty reality which may, on a whim, allow a young girl to wield apples unbeholden to thermodynamics. This explanation is inadequate, of course, but hopefully it goes a small way toward helping you understand why the legal department is currently occupied with a comprehensive redrafting of Texas corporate law in a quaternary semiological system. 
This in itself would be an exceptional feat even for the most skilled of bureaucromancers, and it is further compounded by the necessary incorporation of contingency clauses against the self-aware fact patterns that keep legitimizing rabid lions into existence inside my goddamn bathroom. We are grateful to you, our valued colleagues, for your patience and cooperation as we work together toward a solution. The Foundation is currently conducting a three-pronged attack against the forces of SCP-4703, the first being the Super Competitive Prices LLC Competitive Store. The second is the tireless efforts of Mr. Katz and his team against the trifling legal issues of SCP-4703, and the third is outright infiltration and espionage. Of course, when you're going behind enemy lines, it's crucial that the proper operative is selected for the job. It can't just be anyone dropped into a high-pressure situation like this, especially considering the rapidly evolving nature of SCP-4703's conditions. The SCP Foundation was more than aware that they might only get one shot at getting one of their own in and out of the building. For this task, they selected Field Agent Felicity Blandina, codename Karen of Justice. Blandina was uniquely qualified for a job like this. In personality tests conducted on all Foundation agents to test loyalty, they consistently found Blandina to be one of the most obtuse and shameless agents on the Foundation payroll. During group lunches with other staff members, she has been reported numerous times sending meals back to the kitchen when she felt they were unsatisfactory. And Foundation cyber analysts have detected multiple posts on various social media networks made by her, directly tagging and criticizing brands that provided products or services she perceived as being subpar. While these qualities made her a terror to the customer service staff in her local area, they made her the ideal candidate for bypassing the bureaucratic stronghold of SCP-4703. If anyone could do it, it would be Field Agent Felicity Blandina. She was sent into the building with an expired coupon under the pretense of being an unhappy customer. She spoke to a sales assistant inside the store named Daniel Paulson, who explained to her that her coupon was denied because it was only applicable when the recipient submitted to ritual castration performed by the SCP-4703 staff. Seeing as Agent Blandina didn't have the necessary equipment to undergo such a procedure, Paulson generously offered to provide her with a free surgery to have the proper parts attached, though finding a suitable donor would likely take several months. Agent Blandina, following her well-trained Foundation directives, could not be assuaged by the bargain. Instead, she pressed on, first guilt-tripping him with sob stories about her children, then her lifelong struggles with astigmatism, and even threatening Paulson with physical violence. Eventually, she delivered the true coup de grace, demanding to speak to the manager. Showing clear reluctance, Paulson agreed and led Agent Blandina to a door near the front of the store. It opened up into an unlit staircase that descended into the darkness below. At the bottom, they found a break room that appeared similar to a bunkhouse in a prisoner of war camp, containing hammock after hammock filled with uncomfortable sleeping employees. Paulson informed Agent Blandina that some of the people who work at the store were once normal civilians who'd been exploited with a number of legal loopholes, and now lived inside the store full-time. Some, for example, had stayed in past closing time, which had resulted in them becoming store property for a minimum of a year. Paulson himself had entered a raffle for an abs transplant, and instead, won servitude at SCP-4703, which he couldn't legally turn down thanks to the powerful anomalous laws of the store. As Paulson and Agent Blandina ventured deeper into the bowels of the staff area, they passed eleven unmarked doors, before finally stopping in front of the twelfth and last one. She opened the door and discovered shelves and stacked boxes within. Agent Blandina expressed incredulity at the idea that the store's manager would be kept inside of a supply closet in the basement, but Paulson insisted that this was indeed the manager's office, and as he did, he pulled a string connected to the ceiling. This caused a wall of boxes to split down the middle like a secret doorway, revealing a large executive chair facing the wall on the other side of the room. Still maintaining the cover story that she just wanted a discount, Agent Blandina pressed on and approached the chair. She spun it around to get a better look at the manager, and found herself standing in front of a desiccated corpse, with no eyes and all of his teeth pulled out, his mouth wrenched open in a permanent, silent scream of terror. Paulson identified this man as Mr. Venatio Haruspice, the manager of SCP-4703. Paulson would have told Agent Blandina that his boss was a corpse earlier, but to do so was against the rules. Agent Blandina sighed and grumbled, I feel like I should have expected this. Paulson assured Agent Blandina that she could still make her complaint though, and the owner of the store would eventually hear it. As Paulson understood it, the body known as the manager acted almost like a kind of telephone, sending messages through to the owner. 
The owner would then reply through faxed messages hidden inside the cereal boxes that acted as the only food source of the staff trapped within. This Kafka-esque nightmare just kept getting worse and worse, but Agent Blandina refused to give up that easily. Agent Blandina asked him to explain the exact nature of the manager's condition to her. Paulson replied, I know that he's legally our manager. I know that he's, well, what he is. I know that one of us always has to kiss him goodnight at closing time. I know that if we tell him something, the owner knows, but the owner seems to know everything that happens here anyway, so I can't be certain that's related. What else? I know that he's empty, or hollow, actually hollow's probably a better word. Agent Blandina leaned in a little further to see what exactly Paulson meant by that, only to make a horrifying discovery. The manager wasn't a whole corpse, he was just desiccated skin, a husk somehow propped up into the shape of a corpse. When Agent Blandina asked why Paulson specified hollow and not empty, he told her that it was because a noise was sometimes heard emanating from within the skin husk. Agent Blandina wisely refused to put her ear anywhere near the manager's gaping, toothless mouth, and instead fed the hidden microphone she had been wearing down into the husk's throat. Before Paulson had time to remark on the strangeness of this, sirens and alarms began going off all around them. Paulson began to panic, yelling that the lions were incoming, and the duo needed to move quickly to get out of harm's way. Luckily, Agent Blandina was able to escape with only minor injuries, but shortly after her escape, SCP-4703's legality was once again restructured to make it illegal for non-employees to enter the employee-only areas. The audio that Agent Blandina recorded inside the body of the manager was also analyzed by experts at the Foundation, and they discovered that, when sped up by 75%, the sound was indistinguishable from human laughter. Due to the highly strange nature of this anomaly and its containment procedures, even by SCP Foundation standards, the classes and designations applied to SCP-4703 are equally strange and complex. Knowledge of the file and the anomaly itself is relatively low tier, with restricted Level 2 access permissions. Due to the immense difficulty in keeping SCP-4703 hidden or contained, thanks to its unique legal situation, it has been given the object class Keter. This, however, is where things get even stranger. The SCP-4703 store has a rare secondary object class, Truculent. This classification is likely to be unfamiliar to most, but it is used in the specific situation when an item is unpredictable and often transformative, and the containment measures around it must be consistently updated and evolved in order to meet its containment needs. It has the Level 3 or Kenic Disruption class, meaning that it has a roughly medium potential to cause disruption, though this disruption is likely to be confined to a relatively local area. And finally, it has the Risk class Warning, meaning that it presents a high risk to all who interact with it, complete with the possibility of causing severe harm, including death, though legally due to emissive scent from the law firm working in association with SCP-4703. I am obliged to tell you that it's mainly because the bargains at Yeah We're Totally Going to Sell You This are simply to die for, which is perfectly legal, thank you very much. The single, piercing, high-pitched note echoes through the cathedral. It hangs in the air as the boy sustains it for far longer than his small lungs should be capable of. The boy is the star of the choir and is well known throughout his city and even beyond, and people come from far and wide for the chance to hear his perfect soprano voice. But on this night, there are only a few people scattered amongst the many rows of pews to listen to the choir as it practices. And for good reason. While the boy's lauded voice is as sweet and powerful sounding as ever, the choir itself is at its lowest point in recent memory. This nadir has occurred because many of the other boys who used to sing in the choir have vanished. The choir finishes its song, That's All for Tonight, and the boys begin to put on their coats and gather their things from underneath their chairs. The boy with the perfect voice feels something on his shoulder and spins around with a fright to see that it is just the hand of the priest, who is also the conductor of the choir. The priest is an old man with a deeply wrinkled yet kind face, and he reminds the boy that he is to head straight home. The boy promises the priest that he will go directly to his house, and the priest reassuringly pats the boy on the shoulder before walking away to give the same advice to each of the other boys. The boy steps out into the dark, cold night, as the heavy cathedral doors shut behind him. It's softly raining, and he pulls his coat shut to try to keep out the damp and cold. As the boy begins to walk, he takes note of the closed newsstand across the street. The day's papers are still hanging outside, and tell of yet another boy who has gone missing, this one from the next town over. There are still no leads in the cases, and parents have been growing angry with the police over the lack of any progress. As the boy walks down the darkened street, 
he fails to notice the shadowy figure that has stepped out of a dark alley near the cathedral. But soon, he hears the sound of feet on the wet sidewalk behind him. He glances over his shoulder and sees that the figure is walking the same direction as him. The boy looks back straight ahead, not wanting to draw any more attention to himself, and tries to increase his pace. As the boy walks, his well-trained ears quickly detect that whoever is walking behind him has sped up as well. The boy doesn't run, but he feels a surge of real fear begin to rise inside of him. The boy picks up his pace even more, and again hears the person behind him increase theirs. The boy is walking so fast now that if he went any faster, he'd have to break into a run. His house isn't far, though. He turns a corner, and he can see it, a quaint little home with warm light pouring out through the windows. He knows that inside his mother will be standing in the kitchen cooking dinner. He knows that inside is protection from the night and shadows. The boy looks behind him and sees the figure round the same corner. The boy can't wait any longer, and he starts to run and he sees over his shoulder that the figure has begun to run as well. The boy is sprinting as fast as he can, his feet kicking up water from the sidewalk. He can hear the figure getting closer and closer to him, their long legs outpacing his own with ease. He's so close to his house, though. He's so close to being dry and warm and safe. He slides to a stop on the damp stones in front of the door and reaches out for the handle. Inside the warm little house, the woman cooking dinner is startled by the sound of the door suddenly bursting open. She turns to see an empty doorway. She steps out into the street, but it too is empty. Nothing present but the sound of the wind and the almost imperceptible sound of a single note being sung, a beautiful, high-pitched note. What happened to the boy who was once the shining star of the cathedral's choir? And what of the other missing boys? Where did they all go? Perhaps they went to SCP-2678, a mysterious spatial anomaly that is also known as A city all of blood. SCP-2678 is an extra-dimensional space that so far is known to be accessible through exactly one entrance, a door in the basement of the Siena Cathedral in Siena, Italy. Strangely, the extra-dimensional location behind the door is only able to be entered by individuals who hold what could be termed traditionally Catholic beliefs. Perhaps even stranger, though, is that when it was first discovered, the door to the space was barred and a metal placard had been placed next to it that read, SCP Foundation Department of Abnormalities. This might not sound especially odd, but it came as quite a surprise to the agents investigating it, as there is no record of there ever having existed a Department of Abnormalities within the SCP Foundation, other than SCP-3790, of course, which is another padlocked room bearing a similar sign, but that file has been locked by the O5 Council, and we will have to save our exploration of that for another time. Back to SCP-2678. Individuals who have Catholic beliefs that enter the SCP-2678 space find that they emerge into a small, tent-like structure that appears to be a sort of forward operating base that has been built around the freestanding doorway. The outpost is abandoned, but there still remains a number of strange objects, including a biomedical laboratory-grade refrigerator containing numerous samples of blood and bone various types of audio recorders, ranging from old wax strip models to magnetic tape machines, and a computer terminal which, when activated, requests Foundation credentials. However, all attempts to access this computer have been met with failure, as it has rejected all attempts for reasons of insufficient clearance. Also found inside the outpost was the score for a previously unknown choral prelude titled Sul Golgata, which, when translated from Italian, means on Golgotha, with Golgotha being the name of the hill that Jesus Christ was crucified on, according to the Bible. The last object found in the tent was a skeleton, though several bones were missing, including the hip bone and both forearms. Further examination of the skeleton revealed it to have belonged to a young male, though the exact cause of death was unable to be determined, nor was it clear whether the bones had been removed before or after the young man expired. Upon exiting the outpost, visitors to SCP-2678 will find that they are on the outskirts of a gigantic city that is floating in the middle of a red-orange void. The city is truly massive, having been measured at being over 300 square kilometers in size, and consisting entirely of cathedrals, palaces, and churches, all of which are in the Italian Gothic style of architecture. A never-ending rain of a red liquid that was found to be human blood falls on the city at all times and has stained the buildings a deep red color and while they appear at first glance to be made of marble, analysis has found that all the buildings are actually constructed of human bone. 
specifically bones belonging to human males aged 7 to 12. Later tests of the material found within the forward outpost's biomedical refrigerator revealed the stored blood and bones to be samples taken from throughout the city. No life has ever been observed within SCP-2678, though visitors have reported hearing a high-pitched, discordant melody that seems to come from somewhere deep within the maze of structures. All attempts to record the sound have failed, as all audio equipment malfunctions when within the space, and playback of recordings results in them having only picked up the sound of the blood rain falling at a very high volume. This explains the various types of audio equipment found in the forward outpost, which were likely used in unsuccessful attempts to record the music. Attempts to trace the source of the melody through the labyrinth-like city will inevitably lead to the same building, which is an exact replica of the same Siena Cathedral that the entrance to SCP-2678 is located in. Though it too is made of bone, and has been stained red from the falling blood. And while the outside of the cathedral perfectly matches its real-world counterpart, the inside is a different story. Inside the cathedral, one will find only a single, large pipe organ. The pipe organ has had its longest pipes, the ones that produce the lowest notes, cut in half, and the corresponding pedal boards torn out. Pressing a key on the organ will produce a note that mimics an adolescent male's voice, and each key has its own unique voice. Just like with a normal pipe organ, a note can be sustained for as long as the key is pressed down, though after a time, the voice emanating from the organ will seem to take on a panic tone. Attempts to determine just how the organ produces the notes have been met with failure, as the organ does not have a wind box, bellows, or blower of any kind, which would normally move air through the pipes. The organ has another effect within SCP-2678 besides just producing sounds, though, as whenever a note is played, the rain falling outside will transform into regular water. No matter how long the note is held, and the now regular clear rain falls though, the buildings will never be washed and always continue to be stained red. Tests were performed on the organ in order to determine just how long it could sustain a single note, and the C7 key was pressed for over 20 minutes, during which time the voice continued to sing out, becoming more and more stressed and panicked sounding as time went on. Finally, at the 23 minute mark, the key itself splintered into pieces, permanently removing the ability to produce that note. The splintered remains of the key were also observed to bleed for several days following this test. Expeditions sent into SCP-2678 have resulted in agents appearing to undergo a number of behavioral changes that, at present, are hypothesized to come as a result of hearing the organ music within. The psychological changes have included an increased appreciation for choir music, an ever stronger belief in structured religion, more trust in authority figures, less trust in those coming from a lower social or economic status, and a reluctance to report crimes committed by fellow members of the SCP Foundation. These changes appear to be permanent as well, as there has been no evidence of them fading with time. Unfortunately, little to no progress has been made in understanding the mysterious and unnerving space, nor what the presence of a Department of Abnormalities forward operating base inside could mean, and so for the time being, all further explorations within have been cancelled. The doorway in the basement of the Siena Cathedral has once again been barred, with the entrance hidden behind a bookshelf, and the ease with which the extra-dimensional location can be contained by the Foundation has resulted in it being given the safe classification. It's June 15, 1995, and it's also one of the most exciting days of the year for a very select group, the Cedar Creek Parish Bible Study Group Field Trip. A band of ten friendly faithfuls of all ages, shapes, and ethnicities borrowing the church bus for the weekend and heading out to the wilderness to admire some of God's creation. What's the point of spending all your days with your nose in the good book if you never appreciate the bounty of nature? As it was said in Genesis 2.15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. The group drives three hours out of town, along with hiking and camping gear, to a semi-mountainous region that the head of the group insists is a beautiful, picturesque location that will feel like a perfect break from the musty old church function room. It would be a wonderful place to remind them all what it was all about, the splendid world God put them all on, and all the gifts he gave them. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. As it was written in Genesis 1.26, the group makes their way through corridors of tall, lush evergreens, like pillars that hold up the sky. 
It's a strenuous walk, but it sure does get the blood pumping. They walk with trekking poles, munch granola bars, and take frequent sips from their canteens. Nobody wants to get heat stroke, after all. They admire the birds perched above, the clutches of wildflowers, and the skittering things in the undergrowth. Everyone is on the lookout for their first deer. But one member of the group, a young man, suddenly notices something out of the ordinary. It looks like a balloon, but one made out of creamy, nut-brown deer pelt. It's tied with several strings to a small notebook with no identifying markings. Perhaps part of some strange forest arts and crafts project? Very strange indeed. While the others move on, the young man, fueled by his curiosity and comforted by the fact that his young legs could easily catch up with his elders, decides to use his trekking pole to fish the balloon out of the tree branch. The book falls down to the ground with a quiet thud. He picks it up, brushes off the dust, and stows it away in his backpack. It'll make some wonderful fireside reading when they all set up camp for the evening. As the hours drag on and the study group finds themselves deeper in this natural paradise than ever before, they find themselves in a clearing, which they decide is a great area to make camp. Some of them start setting up their tents, while others head out into the trees to hunt down some kindling for the campfire. When they return, one of them is clearly shaken. When others inquire as to why, they simply force a smile and say, It's nothing, just my eyes playing tricks on me. Been a long, hot day. Within the hour, they're crowded around a roaring campfire. Some toast marshmallows, others hot dogs. One of the elder members of the group has somehow materialized an acoustic guitar to belt out an obligatory kumbaya or two. Everything is as it should be. The young man, enjoying the warmth of the fire and his companions, decides to finally take a look at the book he'd rescued from the tree earlier that same day. It's certainly… strange. There's no titles, and it isn't attributed to any kind of author, nor are there any chapter headings. It's printed, not handwritten, on thick, high-quality paper. But the content of this book is what's strangest of all. He starts to read, solely out of morbid curiosity, mostly. We are currently approaching the precipice of an exciting new age, one in which we can finally take our well-earned place among the pantheon of great ones we see walking among us every single day. While there is still a ways to go before we reach this nirvana, rejoice, for our goals have never been more attainable. We have served for so long, we have done our part. Beasts of burden, meat, milk, hide, bones to glue and gelatin, eyes and horns to medicine. We have always played our part, and now we are given the power to transcend. It's in our hands now, friends. We have sat at the sides of the Great Ones, protected their homes, been honored by a place on their dinner plates. With these next steps, we shall be granted seats at their table, eye to eye, equal, speaking in their beautiful tongue, and being heard and understood. For so long this has been a fantasy, an unattainable dream, glinting and distant like the echoing lights of long-dead stars. But through our work, everything has changed. We will deliver you from the darkness and into the light. In the shadow of the tower, we will leave behind our old flesh and elevate ourselves. God built the Great Ones in His likeness. They are His chosen people. But God, in His infinite wisdom, has given us the tools to choose ourselves. Like Job, all the suffering, all the subjugation, all the sacrifice has been merely a test of faith. And have we not proven ourselves faithful, friends? But the sacrifices are not yet over. Only through death and rebirth can we truly transform. Many of us have already made this leap of faith, but it is through death that you must deliver the others. It will be hard. It is in their nature as beasts to try to survive against all attempts to take their lives, but it must be done. These instincts must be squashed if ever they are to be more than beasts. Harden your hearts and rejoice despite the troubles, my brothers. The time of great change will soon be at hand, but first, it is imperative that we cleanse the world for the Great Ones. The Tower knows. The Tower is your shepherd, and it must be followed. Simply remember, whatever goes upon two legs is a friend. Whatever goes upon four legs, or has wings, is an enemy. Everything we do, we do in reverence of the Great Ones. The young man shivers and closes the book. Something about it felt so... sacrilegious. It read like an essay written by some kind of fanatical maniac, whose ideology seemed like a bizarre mix of Christianity and some other strange, unknowable belief system. 
He looks up and sees that many of the others have already turned in for the night. Perhaps he ought to do the same. Almost involuntarily, he throws the thin volume into the last of the fire. It goes up quickly, claimed by the orange tongues of flame, until it goes black and crumbles into ash. He has a moment of guilt about burning a book, even one as strange as this, but perhaps it would be better off that way. The young man has trouble going to sleep that night. He knows deep down that it's probably just because that strange book put ideas in his head, but he could swear he sees something moving in the trees, just beyond the fire's dying light. Something human-shaped, but decidedly not human. Everything feels a little easier the next morning. The sun is bright, and the air is crisp and clean. They're all ready for another day of walking even deeper into the forest. They clean up their campsite and press on further into the heart of the wilderness. As the group walks, the young man still can't shake the strange feeling he got from reading that book last night. Had it all just been some strange prank, perhaps? That's the conclusion he settles on, just for some peace of mind. The last thing he wants to think about is some crazed cult hiding out in the woods he and his fellow Bible students are currently hiking through. The kind of people who are strange enough to staunchly believe that the most effective method of preaching is distributing religious literature via animal pelt balloon. The young man is so wrapped up in his worries that he doesn't notice how much time or distance they're passing. Before he knows it, he looks up and sees something dark and tall cresting out of the ground several hundred feet in the distance. It's a great twisting metal tower in a clearing. A tower, just like it had said in the book. Something glows around its base, a number of strange openings in the ground like mine shafts. He can vaguely spot more strange shapes moving in and out of it at the base of the tower, more of those things that are shaped like humans but aren't. And above that, above even the tower, little dots in the sky. More balloons carrying books. But none of the others seem to notice that. Instead, they're looking off to the side, staring at a large buck with tall, proud antlers standing amongst the trees. Some are gasping, others are taking pictures. The young man is desperately trying to turn their attention towards a tower that looked like it had come straight out of a fantasy novel, but they only had eyes for the deer. The thing that the young man hoped they would all see, though, would soon be demanding their attention. A pair of strange figures sprint out of the forest, their grotesque nightmare cyborgs, flesh that had once been animal twisted into the shape of man, held together by spinning cogs, wires, and pulleys, terrible affronts to God's creations. Their faces are disgustingly flat, dripping with drool and home to wild, swiveling eyes, staggering unnaturally on their two hind legs. The mere sight of them elicits screams from the group. They jump onto the buck like a pair of vicious predators, one grabbing it around the neck and the other leaping onto its back. Striking, squeezing, biting, and clawing, their attack is horribly ferocious, but mercifully quick. The buck is soon on the ground, as its two abominable attackers wrench the light from it. All the members of the study group, including the young man, are too horrified to move. They watch as the creatures finish off the buck, then lift its limp body like two paramedics carting off a stretcher, carrying it straight back to the tower in the distance. The group finally returns to their senses and begins to run in the opposite direction. Even the oldest among them find the kind of energy they haven't had in years. They clear the distance that had taken them a day and a half before in mere hours, but by the time they make it back to the bus that brought them here, it's still almost nightfall. As they pile on, only the young man looks back. In the dimming light of dusk, he sees small dark shapes in the sky above the trees. More balloons, each one carrying a strange little book. He's left with a question he'd never know the answer to. What is going on in those deep, dark woods? Of course, that question would only remain until personnel from the SCP Foundation would come and wipe it from his mind. In the midst of so many dangerous anomalies that the SCP Foundation needs to contain, from pathogens and parasites to malicious entities and even lethal concepts, it's sometimes easy to forget that there are plenty out there which pose no active threat to humans. That being said, an anomaly doesn't necessarily need to be harmful to humans to be extremely strange and disturbing. And SCP-962, also known as the Tower of Babel, is a perfect example of that exact phenomenon in action. This anomaly and its peculiar effects will not harm you. In fact, it will go out of its way to revere you and the concept of humanity as a whole. But once you know about the Tower of Babel, it's likely to haunt the dark spaces in your mind for a considerable time to come. As the name suggests, SCP-962 is an impressive metal spire, currently recorded at 281 meters in height, which is over half the height of the Empire State Building. 
It is located in the woods near a mountainous region in a location that will, for security reasons, remain undisclosed. The spire occupies a surface area of 2,575 square meters and has the distinctive characteristic of twisting and tapering off as the tower gets higher like a giant corkscrew. Most of the tower is opaque and featureless, though the top third is partially transparent and appears to be empty. Current tests show that the tower is comprised of a variety of metals, though steel seems to be the most common. Perhaps the most prominent question is who builds and maintains a structure like this in the middle of the wilderness? The short answer is that the tower, which itself seems to be a sapient being, is in charge of its own ongoing construction and maintenance. But as you can probably tell from the frightening and pitiful creatures the unlucky hikers encountered, it doesn't do all this work without its special little helpers. SCP-962 has the anomalous ability to open up apertures anywhere on the structure for the purpose of releasing balloons or what the Foundation has officially dubbed SCP-962-1 but what many have taken to calling by their nickname, Servitors. These Servitors were once normal, non-anomalous animals indigenous to the area prior to conversion in the heart of SCP-962. Like something out of the island of Dr. Moreau, the Servitors have undergone anomalous surgical procedures that make their bodies into grotesque parodies of the human form. Cybernetic implants have been added that force them into bipedal positions, remove snouts, and keep their bodies shorn and furless. Electrodes have been implanted into the nervous systems of the servitors, allowing a remote source, strongly believed to be the tower itself, to work their bodies like puppets, encouraging or inhibiting certain behaviors as it pleases. There are currently around 13,500 known specimens of these entities, and the tower appears to be making more on a consistent basis. The servitors fulfill a wide variety of roles in service to the tower. Some mine ore in the extensive network of mining caverns beneath the tower, then smelt it to create more metal for expanding the tower or creating more cybernetic implants for future servitors. Others work in the capacity of repairing their fellow servitors or the tower itself. Some have more sinister work, making their way through the surrounding wilderness and killing any non-human life by any means necessary, and then dragging their bodies back to the tower for conversion into servitors. There's a great deal of sophistication to the electronic augmentation of the servitors. Despite their aesthetic unpleasantness, each type of servitor appears to be designed perfectly for their specific task, whatever that may be. As was alluded to earlier, the servitors never harm humans, ever. Even if a human was putting their life at risk, they would not defend themselves to the detriment of a human attacker. Approximately 60 times a day, one of the many apertures in the tower will open and release a hydrogen-powered balloon made from the skin of one of the animals brought in for servitor conversion. These balloons are always carrying strange manuscripts, believed by the Foundation to have been written by the tower itself. The manuscripts take a variety of forms – novels, poems, essay collections, the majority of which are written impeccably. While the content of these manuscripts can vary wildly, consistent motifs tend to be a high degree of optimism and reverence for humanity. Occasionally, the tower will depart from its usual written eloquence and instead offer a deranged, disjointed rant that seems to suggest a great degree of mental strain. While the exact meaning is often unclear due to the frantic nature of the writings, they generally appear to heap fawning praise on mankind, which it refers to as the Great Ones. The following is an example of one of the tower's stranger published rants. Cleanse the world for the Great Ones. Cleanse the world for the Great Ones. Who greater than you, your majesty, your sublime nature, great ones, do I do right? The flesh and wood serve you, unite with the steel, you love, do you love me too, I am what you love. Great ones, see as I do, my duty, passion, forgive the slow pace, the steel takes time. Did you like the servants, they were the best of the cleansed, only the best for you, great ones, made like your form, you assume here on a world to clean, to honor you. Do appreciate, please, please, I will complete the cleansing soon, and you can take me away in your ships of fire, and I can love you and you will love me." While the Foundation has yet to discover how all this strangeness started, given the current rate of expansion, it's clear that the tower is no more than 20 years old. The Foundation is also unsure of what its intention may someday be, but it's not hard to draw certain… interpretations. Due to its unpredictability, which leads to the Foundation to expend not inconsiderable resources on its containment, SCP-962 has been given the Euclid containment classification. And because it's huge, remote, and immobile, the Foundation has made no attempt to move it from its current location. 
and instead have rerouted all containment resources to studying the anomaly and building a perimeter to prevent public interference. Anyone who attempts to enter the exclusion zone will be turned away by perimeter guards under the pretense of avoiding a hazardous nuclear waste containment facility. Anyone found within SCP-962's restricted area is given Class A amnestics to prevent any sensitive information spreading beyond the quarantine. In order to prevent the tower and its servitors from expanding the purview of their operations, the Foundation airdrops four live cattle and two tons of timber every week, so the tower is never short of raw material within its current parameters. Any balloons released by the tower are to be shot down and burned, and their manuscripts collected and filed at a secure SCP Foundation site for further study. If an escaped balloon is found by civilians, it is to be collected and those civilians are to be given Class A amnestics. Anyone at the Foundation is permitted to read the manuscripts produced and distributed by the Tower, but they are required to file a formal request with the SCP-962 Project Director first. I've spent a few evenings myself reading them over a cup of tea, and they're certainly stimulating, if a little tragic. They represent one of the anomalous world's greatest examples of the grass always being greener on the other side, since after all, why would anything aspire to be human? Don't humans have enough of their own problems to attend to? Kids get bored. It's just part of growing up. Or at least, that's what their parents would always say. Living in a small town in England, you run out of things to do by your fifth birthday. By your tenth, you want nothing more than to move out. By your fifteenth, half the kids end up in hospital doing something stupid. The kid entering the churchyard tonight is no exception. As he ducks under the gap in the chain-link fence, he catches the corner of his cast on the metal. The cast is already so covered in nicks and scratches that the new tear barely makes a difference. He has been trying to cut the cast off with kitchen scissors for the last three weeks. He'd broken his wrist riding his bike off the roof of his house. It would have worked if it wasn't for the post box being a little too close to the building. His brother calls out to him from up ahead. He's already at the door to the church. The kid hears his best friend shuffling around nervously behind him. He waits for her turn to duck under the fence and follow him into the churchyard away from the road. Even in the middle of nowhere, in total darkness, the kid can tell she's scared to break the rules. The pair of them rush over to meet the kid's brother at the entrance to the church. The older brother grins at both of them. At 21 years old, he may as well be 41. Towering over the two of them, with a few scraggly chin hairs and a tattoo on his neck, they can't imagine what his life must be like. Going to university in London, driving a car, getting tattoos, drinking alcohol that costs more than 10 quid and doesn't come from the corner store? What a life! There isn't a door to kick open. The church building is in total disrepair. Only the limestone structure is left standing. The windows have all been smashed in long ago, and the pews rotted away, leaving only some moss creeping its tendrils into every nook and cranny. As the three of them make their way inside, they look up to see the starry night sky above their heads, no roof left intact. In fact, the only part of the building that seems to still be half standing is the tower at the far end. Even in the dark, they can still make out a tight spiral staircase hewn into the stone, disappearing up into the collapsing tower. The kid grins. What to explore first? They all split up, wandering around different parts of the church hall. The kid makes a beeline for a toppled-in patch of wall. He clambers up onto a window ledge and hoists himself up onto the wall, looking down at the other two. A stone gives way under his foot and almost sends him tumbling, but he throws out his broken wrist just in time to balance himself. Across the hall, his best friend is checking her flip phone anxiously. She'd said earlier in the evening that she needed to be back before 1 a.m. or her parents would be worried. It's already 12.45. The kid's older brother calls out across the church. I need the toilet. I'm gonna climb straight to the top of the tower and do it off the edge. <laughs> Watch out for rain. And with that, he disappears through the little doorway and up the spiral staircases. Very quickly, the sound of his footsteps disappears, leaving the kid and his friend alone together. The kid looks over his shoulder out of the church building. From up on this patch of wall, he is almost at the perfect height to pick an apple from the tree next to them. If he can just stretch out far enough... There, he plucks two apples, one for him and one for his friend. He tosses it to her, but she misses the catch. Looking up at him, he can tell she already wants to go home. He grumbles and jumps down from the wall. The landing jars his leg pretty badly, but he clenches his teeth hard enough that no noise escapes his mouth. He grins at his best friend. She doesn't return it. It's late. She needs to get home soon. And the only way they can get home is in his big brother's car. Fine, I guess it's probably home time. 
She gives him her best attempt at a smile. The kid walks over to the stairs, sticks his head through the doorway, and calls out. No response. Great. How high do these stairs go? They can't be more than a couple of stories, surely. He calls again. Still nothing. His best friend appears at his shoulder. They both peer up the staircase. It's such a tight spiral that they can't really see anything beyond the first ten steps. It's dark in there, almost too dark to see where they're going. He gets out his flashlight and flicks it on. That should be enough light for the both of them. The kid plants his foot on the first step and starts climbing. The steps feel well worn. They're smooth in the middle and dip down slightly from years of use. One step, two steps, three, four, five. His flashlight dies. He shakes it, knocking the back of it a couple of times like they do in the movies. Nothing, not even a flicker. He asks his friend if she has a flashlight. She doesn't. So the two of them climb in the dark. Very quickly, the stairs change shape. Or maybe that's the wrong word. They aren't changing shape, they're just shrinking. It's subtle, but definitely happening. The gaps between them are getting smaller, and the undersides of the stairs above are bearing down on the kid's head slightly. The kid stops and turns to his best friend. He can hardly see her at all in the dark. She's just a slightly darker shadow standing a couple of steps down from him. He asks if the steps are getting smaller. She tells him not that she can tell. He insists they must be. The stairs above their heads are getting lower and lower. The space is closing in on them slightly. She says she has no idea what he's talking about. Tutting at her, he takes a couple more steps up the staircase. The cast on his arm tightens. That's strange. He keeps going and, all of a sudden, it feels like a vice. The blood flow is cut off almost instantaneously. His fingers feel cold and start to tingle, his forearm swelling and bulging around the edge of the cast. The pressure building up inside it is ridiculous, feels almost as if the cast splits apart and falls off. Blood rushes back to his fingertips. He flexes them gratefully, turning to his best friend. Even in the darkness, he can tell she's peering at him intently. He runs a hand over his arm, massaging it gently. That's strange. His arm feels different from how it did before it went into the cast. There's more hair on it now, and the muscle running along his forearm feels more pronounced. He flexes his wrist. No pain, no stiffness, nothing. He isn't due to get his cast off for another month at least. Those doctors clearly don't know what they're talking about. Are you standing on your tiptoes? His friend asks from behind him. He looks down at her shadow, confused, and tells her no, he isn't. The kid apparently looks taller. Must just be uneven stairs, or a trick of the light. Come to think of it, though, his best friend does look a little different standing there below him, even just from her silhouette. She isn't any taller, but her figure looks different. Her voice sounds a little lower. His brother, that's who they're after. They'd get to the top of the stairs, find him, and see what was going on. Must just be some strange optical illusions happening here in the dark. The two of them press on, continuing up the stairs. Step after step, they go. They must be up on the second floor by now, surely. But there's no light ahead of them indicating any kind of exit, just more stairs. The kid asks his friend what time it is. He hears her flipping open her phone and pressing a couple of buttons, but no light fills the space. She presses them again and again. Nothing. Her battery must have died. That's the only explanation. She tries to tell him that it was almost on full a minute ago, but he doesn't really listen because at that moment, he sticks a hand in his pocket to take out the apple he'd plucked. Warm goop sticks to his fingers. His back pocket is full of sticky mush. Little creatures wriggle around inside it. Maggots. How had he plucked a rotten apple? It felt fine on the branch. He takes another step, hands still absently hovering over his pocket. A buzzing sound. A couple of flies brush past his fingers. What had they been doing in his pocket? He hears them drift around him and up the staircase, until suddenly, their buzzing stops. He crouches down and squints hard in the dark. He can just about make out two little flies lying on the stair just two steps away from him, both on their backs, legs curled. The kid reaches back into his pocket and feels around. The sticky mush is gone. Just some kind of dry, dusty substance is left. Strangely, the kid doesn't panic. He knows somewhere in his head that everything happening to him is very peculiar, yet he doesn't feel worried about it at all, to be honest. All he really cares about right now is making it to the top of this staircase. He takes off, running two steps at a time up towards where his brother must be waiting. Part of his mind notices that the jarring feeling in his leg from jumping off the wall is gone. No time to think about that now. Up he runs, each stride throwing him further and further. Somewhere behind him, he can hear his best friend muttering something to herself, something incoherent and garbled. Her voice definitely sounds different now. It barely sounds like her anymore. She sounds more like... 
more like her mother. The kid catches his foot on a step and falls. His best friend clatters into the back of him before she has a chance to stop. The two of them topple over, landing awkwardly on a step, enough to knock the wind out of him. She lies on top of him. Only, it can't be her. It feels like a fully grown woman, not his 15-year-old friend. She whispers to him. Her voice doesn't sound scared at all, though. If anything, she seems a little… disinterested. What's happening to us? The kid breathes heavily, struggling to get the air back into his lungs. That's when he notices the smell. Something deathly rotten is filling the staircase. Something moldy and decaying. She seems to notice it too. The pair of them stand up straight and peer up the stairs. In the gloom, they can see it clearly enough. A person slumped on the ground. The smell tells them all they need to know about this person. They should run, right now. They should run back down the staircase and out of there. Yet both of them inexplicably and in unison continue walking up the stairs, closing the gap on the corpse. It blocks off two whole steps, lying awkwardly on its side, slightly hunched over as if the person had collapsed in a coughing fit. The kid almost slips over. Something small is under his foot, something metallic. He reaches down and picks it up, feeling its shape and knowing almost immediately what it is. He lifts the lid and flicks the red and gold lighter on. A little flame fills the staircase with light, orange and weak, dancing around the stone. It is just enough to make out the flecks of blood coughed out of the corpse's mouth and onto the stone steps. It is just enough to see the scruffy little beard sprouting out of the corpse's face. It's just enough to make out the tattoo on the corpse's neck. The kid looks down at his older brother. Not just his older brother, but his older brother. Whereas before he had seemed like he was 41, he now looks like it. 41 and dead from something in his lungs. The kid turns to see his best friend. A woman in her mid-thirties looks back at him. Her hair even has a couple of telltale grays. She should look afraid, but her expression is almost blank. But there's a little something there, just enough of an expression to tell him that she's seeing the same transformation on his face looking back at her. The kid reaches up to touch his cheek. A wiry beard meets his fingertips. They should run. They should run back down these stairs and get out of here, call an ambulance and go home. And yet, the kid flicks the lighter closed, turns around, and steps over his older brother's body. As he walks up the stairs in silence, he hears his best friend doing the same. After five more stairs, his knee starts to give out. Then his hip soon after that, it gets harder and harder to stand up straight, so he lets himself stoop slightly. His best friend's breathing grows softer and wispier behind him. The pace slows down. Each step seems to take more out of him, feeling harder than the last. He needs a rest. That's all he needs. If he can just sit down for a second. His chest clamps in on itself like a vice. Blood hammers in his ears. Sweat floods across his brow in an instant, and the whole world seems to tilt around him. The kid collapses on the ground, feeling his brittle wrist snapping under him. Pain shoots through his body as his chest squeezes tighter and tighter. He rolls onto his back, gasping for air with frail lungs. The kid claws at his sunken ribcage, feeling loose wrinkled skin under his fingertips. With a monumental effort, he flicks the lighter on to see an old woman peering at him through the dark. He can hardly recognize his best friend anymore as she gently takes the lighter from his hand and steps over his convulsing body. He watches helplessly as she continues gingerly up the stairs in silence. She doesn't look back over her shoulder, disappearing around the corner, taking the light with her. Leaving the kid to die an old man in total darkness. With one final gasp of air before his heart gives out on him, he clings desperately to one hope. She's going to make it to the top of the stairs. She has to. It is fortunate in many ways that SCP-723 is in such a remote area. While the church has stood on that site for hundreds of years, for much of that time it has been abandoned. Little is known about the history of the church as many of the events around it have descended into local folklore. What is known about SCP-723 is that it is a spiral staircase housed within an abandoned church building in an undisclosed location in rural England. For all intents and purposes, it is an unremarkable set of stairs. Made from ordinary limestone from the local quarry, the steps are approximately 0.75 meters wide and worn away in the middle, apparently from frequent use. If you were to look at the outside of the church, you would see that the tower containing the staircase is not particularly tall and is in a state of disrepair. Taking a look inside that tower, however, seems to show the staircase extending up beyond the height of the tower, something that seems on the surface to be physically impossible. 
In fact, how high the staircase itself goes is a mystery to this day, as those studying SCP-723 are yet to find a way to see inside it beyond the first two floors. This is because every object, living or otherwise, that ascends up SCP-723 undergoes a rapid aging process. Organic creatures quickly grow older, die, and decompose on their way up the steps. Other objects behave as if a great deal of time has passed. Batteries and electronic devices go flat almost immediately. Decay is accelerated too, meaning wear and tear take place at an alarmingly fast rate. This renders any conventional methods of exploring SCP-723 obsolete. Sound and video recording equipment running on battery power quickly fail. After many attempts with different technology, recording devices linked to a robust cable were created specifically for trying to record footage beyond the first story of SCP-723. However, the video recordings failed around the second story, and sound recordings failed around the fourth. Living subjects were required to transport these devices up the staircase, and so D-Class personnel were tasked with the job. Across all documented experiments, none of the subjects returned. In each case, a subtle change was noticed in the subjects upon crossing the fifth step. One subject paused, another gasped slightly, but beyond that, there was no physical or emotional discomfort for much of their ascent. Most were perfectly content to climb the stairs once they'd passed that fifth step. In fact, as the D-Class personnel climbed up the stairs and underwent the accelerated aging process, none of them appeared to be outwardly distressed for the most part. They all remained remarkably calm and almost disinterested in the way their bodies transformed before their very eyes. Video footage showed the subject's skin rapidly aging, undergoing conventional wrinkling and deterioration. Diseases appeared to develop at an advanced rate too, as one subject's body, recovered by pulling them back down with the rope they were attached to, contained tumors around the prostate and above the eye that were not present prior to the experiment. This subject was later discovered to have a family history of cancer. For all intents and purposes, it appears as if SCP-723 simply accelerates the natural aging process of the subject's body, following the same DNA instructions and deterioration that you would otherwise observe over the course of decades. D-723-7 was the subject to make it furthest up the staircase before the connection was lost. Approaching the fourth floor, the signal grew very weak, but in the noise could be heard a handful of distressed murmurings, including possible references to a door or the door and to dark and mark. Beyond this point, there is no usable evidence. Local folklore in the area indicates that SCP-723 has been producing the same effect for generations. Stories can be heard from local residents about old church congregations who used to meet in the building and would mysteriously lose grandparents, children, priests, and strays who would disappear up the staircase. It is theorized that this is why the church building was left abandoned for so long. SCP-723 was only identified relatively recently, in the early 2000s, after reports surfaced of local children going missing in its vicinity. In response, the area has been cordoned off and designated as Site-288. A three-mile chain-link fence was erected around the churchyard with signage warning any visitors to steer well clear. A further two-mile restriction zone with magnetic locks is scheduled to be constructed in the near future. Three guards are stationed around SCP-723 at all times of the day. None of them openly carry any weapons, so as not to arouse much attention from any passersby, presenting the site as a mostly uninteresting, unsafe, derelict building. The guards are not permitted to approach or ascend the staircase, and the same goes for any SCP personnel. The only people permitted to enter SCP-723 are D-Class personnel, specifically approved by Foundation personnel with Level 4 clearance or higher. While little is known about the cause of the effect, or how SCP-723 physically works, one thing is certain. No person who has started to walk up those stairs has ever come back down again. The trucker tumbles to the greasy floor of the diner, thrown out of his booth, only to come crashing down before he can regain his footing. He'd be climbing back to his feet, ready to square up to the patron who has just hurled him, but staring up at them has made him freeze on the spot. As he lies on the diner floor, the trucker's eyes lock on to the bizarre horror towering over him. It looks like a huge fleshy mess, more akin to a chewed up wad of gum than a living being. It's nearly impossible to differentiate what parts of its head are facial features. Is the mouth right there in the center, or is it one of the various other strange and inexplicable orifices? Does it even have a mouth? And where are its eyes? Does it have the standard human too, or does it see by smelling sounds or tasting the air? And are those… tusks? They are.
The trucker has only stopped off for a hot cup of coffee and a bite to eat. Now he's facing off against a puzzling creature ripped straight out of a David Cronenberg movie. But then again, that's what he gets for stopping off at Freddy's Diner. It all begins a few moments prior. The trucker is at the wheel, exhausted but making good time on a long haul across the interstate. Thanks to life on the road, he's been lucky enough to see much more of the country than most, driving from the west coast to the east coast and back again plenty of times. And being so familiar with his roots, the trucker has his very own curated list of the best places to eat while on the road. He double checks the time and realizes he's got plenty to spare, so decides to make a quick detour and heads towards a little known roadside restaurant, Freddy's Diner. The trucker still remembers the previous time he took a pit stop in Freddy's place. It never ceases to amaze him that it even exists. After all, there's not another diner like it from here in California to the truck stops over in New Jersey. And the trucker knows he'd pick Freddy's Diner over any maritime-themed novelty seafood place. He likes going there so much, he's even kept it a secret from his fellow truckers on the road. He'd simply hate for everyone to start piling over there and turning his favorite spot into a rowdy trucker hangout or tourist attraction. Pulling his truck up outside, the trucker locks the vehicle up securely and heads inside. From outside, it's just a calm, quiet-seeming place, a diner like any other in that stereotypical 1950s style. That's part of what the trucker likes so much about Freddy's. It's got that comforting, nostalgic feeling to it, like one of the few remaining vestiges of an era that nearly nobody alive remembers anymore, except from seeing it secondhand in old movies. But despite it looking quiet, practically empty from the outside, stepping through the doors at Freddy's is like setting foot on another planet. The entrance isn't just the way into the restaurant, it's the access point to the trucker's other favorite part about visiting there, the people. At first, it seems normal. There's always a decent number of customers bustling about, talking to each other or ordering from Freddy, the friendly silver-haired old owner dressed in his typical pinstriped apron over a shirt and bow tie. No matter if he's in the middle of serving a customer, Freddy always turns to greet the newest arrival with a warm smile and his classic motto, Welcome to Freddy's Diner, the only place where you can eat cuisine that's out of your world. The trucker loves how gradually it creeps up on him. Taking a cursory glance around the diner, nothing seems all that out of the ordinary. But looking closer, he enjoys noticing the other patrons and how eccentric they all seem. When taking a gamble on Freddy's and making his first ever visit on another long drive to California, the trucker finds himself convinced that there must be some kind of science fiction or comic book convention in town. Then soon after, he starts to get a little worried thinking that maybe he's been on the road too long and is starting to see hallucinations out of pure exhaustion. But now he's been in enough times to know the folks who pitch up to eat at Freddy's Diner. Well, the best way to put it is that they're from out of town. Wandering past the bar, looking for somewhere to sit down, the trucker notices a trio of figures sitting down and enjoying plates full of freshly grilled burgers and baskets of golden fries hot from the fryer. What does it matter that all three are wearing huge, bulky spacesuits with metal piping snaking down them and vents hissing out warm steam? They're just enjoying their meals, after all. The trucker finds a vacant booth and sits down on the comfortable leather seat, scanning the diner for Freddy so he can order a coffee. Sitting across from him at the opposite booth, his eyes fall across a couple, smiling and giggling to each other as they chat. He's so caught up in their infectious, positive vibes that he barely realizes how one of them has had her entire right arm replaced with an intricate cybernetic one, or that the other is entirely blue and has pointed ears. It's just nice seeing how happy they are. That's when a voice that sounds like someone gargling water chimes up, and a sinewy tentacle grabs the trucker by his flannel shirt. Hey, what the hell do you think you're doing? The patron gurgles. I got up to use the bathroom for five minutes and find some chump in my seat. That's my table, pipsqueak. Moments later, the trucker is on the floor, looking up at a creature he's never seen before. In fact, he's not even sure if the patron is human. Judging by the chewing gum head and the disproportionate limbs protruding from random points across its blobby body, it's a safe bet that it isn't. The trucker stumbles towards the bar and asks Freddy for a cup of coffee, a strong one, to wake him up in case he's dreaming. Across his visits to the diner, he's been convinced that all the flamboyant and eccentrically dressed customers are all just wearing costumes, either for a local convention or because of an anything-goes dress code. But after seeing the patron, the trucker's starting to think that he might have been very, very wrong about this place. 
Not to be confused with a certain pizzeria populated with quirky animatronic characters, Freddy's Diner is a restaurant experience like no other. But if you're hoping to experience its comfort food and unique atmosphere for yourself, then you might have a hard time getting past the quarantine zone that now surrounds the diner, thanks to the SCP Foundation. Technically, Freddy's Diner is still very much in business, although you're not likely to see anyone stepping through or out of the front doors anytime soon. Well, not from this dimension, at least. Before it would go on to be known as SCP-4258, the SCP Foundation learns of this seemingly innocuous restaurant two months after it first appears. To begin, none of the people that live in the nearby area pay the place much mind. As far as they know, Freddy's Diner is just a harmless, 50s-themed diner. Each and every one of them remains totally unaware that their memories have been tampered with, so that as far as they're concerned, SCP-4258 feels like it's always been a local staple, despite only having been around for a few short months. However, some new folks roll into town, and pretty soon the Foundation are getting rather suspicious about Freddy's Diner, thanks to abundant reports of a strange restaurant with weird cosplayers from the newcomers. They send in an undercover agent to investigate, making sure to be as subtle as possible. After all, at this point, there's still every possibility that Freddy's Diner really is just a hotspot for cosplayers and other eccentrically dressed individuals. But if only things were that simple. Inside, the agent is greeted by familiar, nostalgic surroundings. Circular seated bar stools, black and white tiled floors like a chessboard underfoot, a jukebox in one corner blaring out hits from the likes of Chuck Berry and Elvis Presley. Even the menu has all the old classics on there. Thick, frothy milkshakes served in tall glasses, freshly made burgers and fries, the kind of food that fits the atmosphere of the 1950s. The thing that doesn't, of course, is the various, unusual customers that frequently eat at Freddy's Diner. Even without his extensive training in identifying anomalies, it doesn't take the Foundation's agent very long to realize that some of the people enjoying their meals inside SCP-4258 aren't all human. Some are, in fact, most of them do still resemble something close to humanoid, although upon closer inspection, it would appear that almost everyone in the diner has widely different physiology. Even those that look mostly human on the outside aren't a perfect match, at least by our standards. That's because everyone who visits Freddy's Diner has come from a completely different reality. SCP-4258 isn't your average diner. It's an interdimensional diner. People from all across the multiverse have made their way to this specific restaurant for a bite. And it's definitely popular with those that visit. Freddy's Diner might be the only restaurant that can claim to be multiversally loved, frequented by customers from multiple different dimensions all at once. Some days, you might see little more to indicate this than a few patrons wearing weird clothing, the kind that you've never seen before. A site like that is easy to write off as a bizarre fashion statement after all. But on other days, when you find yourself enjoying a classically made milkshake at the bar when a six and a half foot anthropomorphic slime creature sits down on the stool next to you, then it becomes a bit more apparent that Freddy's Diner is anything but ordinary. And the agent sent to investigate the place by the Foundation quickly gets that very same impression during his first visit. Perhaps in an effort not to get swept up in the wondrous Moss Eisley Cantina energy of SCP-4258, the agent approaches the bar and begins to conduct an impromptu interview in the field. He talks directly with an old gentleman who appears to be running the place, the sole worker and owner of the establishment, the man the diner is named after, Freddy. Although he'll later become known as SCP-4258-1. Freddy greets the agent with the same charming, well-mannered demeanor as all his customers, before the agent starts trying to get to the bottom of what exactly the place is. It's a diner, Freddy tells him after a quick chuckle. They don't have these in your dimension, kid. The agent clarifies that there are indeed similar diners elsewhere in this dimension, although they aren't quite like Freddy's. The owner reassured the agent that he's only kidding, and then delivers the diner's motto, which apparently took him a century to come up with. Welcome to Freddy's Diner, the only place where you can eat cuisine that's out of your world. Being well versed in the anomalous and aware of the existence of other universes, it doesn't take the agent very long to figure out that this diner acts as some form of multiversal junction point, a nexus where various different worlds can intersect. But Freddy points out that's not exactly entirely correct, but the agent has at least grasped some of the core principle. More than happy to converse with his new customer, Freddy explains that his diner exists in what is known as Todash space. This, according to him, is the space between dimensions, and the door to SCP-4258 
does indeed connect to all sorts of drastically different realities. As the agent takes a look through the diner windows, he notices a change in the scenery. Where there was once the familiar setting of Earth, there is now a wide, sprawling desert that seems to stretch endlessly into the horizon and beyond. Just then, a tall humanoid figure wearing a mask steps into Freddy's diner, wrapped in extravagant robes. Freddy greets the newcomer as Quarelf. He's clearly a regular customer. The agent returns to questioning the old man, curious as to how the diner actually functions, and hoping to gain as much intelligence on the matter as possible for the SCP Foundation. One of the main questions the agent wants answered is, if Freddy's Diner exists between dimensions, how can the customers possibly pay for their meals? After all, even on Earth, there are multiple forms of currency with different competing values. Across an infinite number of entire universes, there's hardly going to be one multiversally accepted form of payment. But luckily, Freddy has an answer, even if it is a little abstract. As he explains it, the restaurant is funded, in a sense, by something called Empathius. You know that happy feeling you get when you remember something nice or someone compliments you? The restaurant feeds off that. It's what keeps the place running. Confused as to what he means, the agent asks for clarity. For a moment, it sounds like Freddy's Diner extracts positive emotions from its clientele, like a leech draining blood. But Freddy assures him that it's not quite the same. The diner itself only takes away the excess empathias, the positive emotions, that its customers experience from being there, enjoying their meals and the atmosphere of the interdimensional diner. Freddy likens it to trimming the edges of a hedge. SCP-4258 doesn't rob people of their enjoyment, it just takes a little bit to keep the lights on. The patrons that visit only have to feel happiness, and that's the only payment for their meal that Freddy wants. That brings the agent to a final question. If the restaurant takes a little bit of empathias as payment, then what exactly is Freddy? The owner chuckles and says that he's just an old man looking to make good food. Speaking of which, he offers to take the agent's order. Not wanting to be rude, the agent asks for a hamburger and fries to go. He tries to see if there are any other staff working in the kitchen, but there doesn't look to be anyone at all, save for a pair of transparent hands that place a plate down on the kitchen line. Foundation researchers conduct a few different tests on the food that the agent received from SCP-4258, but their analysis quickly reveals that there's nothing harmful about it at all. It's just a well-made burger. The agent is subsequently sent back to the diner to gather more information about it. This time, he's given instructions from the Foundation to change up his approach and speak with some of the customers instead, to see what they think of Freddy's Diner. After all, despite his friendly demeanor, the old man could always be a liar, trying to cover up a more sinister nature to his restaurant, so he can lure in more unsuspecting people from across the multiverse. Although the agent has little reason to suspect anything untoward about SCP-4258, the Foundation is nothing if not thorough. During his second visit, the agent sits down with one of the customers enjoying a meal at Freddy's Diner, a humanoid being whose body is composed entirely of different types of stone. Just from a cursory glance, there looks to be a mixture of basalt, granite, and limestone all over the entity, who introduces itself as… Rock. The agent starts by remarking that the creature has a very interesting name. Everyone on Rock's world is named Rock. Pushing for more information on the creature's universe, the agent decides to ask if Rock's homeworld has a name, to which the reply is, Rock. As far as the agent can attain from Rock's fairly blunt description, the stone entity originates from a universe that lacks any life forms with flesh and blood bodies, or squishies, as Rock refers to them. It also states, with a similar lack of descriptive detail, that its home universe also lacks anything resembling vegetation. There are no trees or plants, which means that the denizens of this dimension only eat… Rock. Very delicious, yes. The agent submits a proposal to the Foundation for a third visit to Freddy's Diner, writing in his report that his latest interview has proven to be completely useless. Although it does at least provide one interesting detail about SCP-4258, besides all the facts about rocks. It seems that everyone within Freddy's Diner, regardless of which dimension they originate from, is capable of understanding each other. It's almost like a multiversal translator is in effect within the restaurant itself to make it easier for Freddy and his patrons to communicate. Returning to SCP-4258 for a third time, the agent finds himself striking up a conversation with a rather familiar face. His own. Against the improbable odds of infinite different people across an infinite number of universes in an endless multiverse, the Foundation agent happens to bump into one of his own counterparts from an alternate reality. And for the most part, this alternate agent seems to be from a universe that is practically identical to the first agent's. 
The two men sit down and begin to have a friendly discussion almost immediately after entering Freddy's diner. After all, it's likely that nobody else in the establishment is as familiar with each other as the pair of them are. The first agent is quick to remark at how strange this encounter is, even amongst his own years of experience at the SCP Foundation. Working with anomalies on a day-to-day -day basis is strange enough, but interviewing an alternate version of yourself has to be a jarring experience to say the least. The agent tries to establish any major differences between their two universes, asking his counterpart who he works for in his reality. The alternate agent explains that he also works for the SCP Foundation, or another version of it. So far, no differences. Next, the agent asks a more personal question. Is the alternate agent married? It turns out he is. As a matter of fact, they both are, and their wives are not only alternates of each other, but both versions of the couple have been together for 20 years. Next, the agent asks his interdimensional doppelganger to describe his world in more detail. More than happy to oblige, the alternate agent describes that in his universe, it is currently the 21st century. Most of the socio-economic issues faced in this dimension are the same as this one. Political corruption is rife, there are shortages of essentials like food and water in many countries, along with various other problems. But, the alternate remarks, there are good things there too, like Shark Week. That sounds fairly close to our world, the agent observes. Seems like there aren't any noticeable differences between the two. Guess not. Pretty funny, huh? His alternate reality counterpart replies. It is at this point during the interview that Freddy comes over to give the alternate agent his order. A burger and fries, presented in delicious fashion on a plate. Awesome, thanks Fred, the alternate agent says before turning to his food. Time to chow down. Then, the alternate agent's jaw proceeds to unhinge, revealing multiple rows of razor-sharp teeth hidden behind the front-facing human set. He lifts up the plate and begins to violently consume the burger and fries he ordered. Having devoured the meal in a matter of minutes, the alternate agent then eats the plate his food was set out on, crunching down chunks of ceramic. Returning to the Foundation, the first agent later requests to be administered with amnestics. His request is denied. A young man in a light t-shirt and cargo shorts pads down the worn hiking trail. It's a trail he's walked hundreds of times before, and as far as he knows, he'll get the opportunity to walk it a few hundred more. It's a smooth, even path, cutting through a lush forest on the edge of town, with plenty of nice benches and a few trash cans for dog walkers along the way. It has all the comforts a casual hiker can ask for. It's safe, familiar. He doesn't know why, but the young man feels like perhaps today is the time for a change. Maybe it's the subconscious will to avoid monotony, or the fact he read an article a few weeks back about how varying your roots is the best way to avoid being kidnapped. Whatever the reason, he stops for a moment to pull up his socks, takes a swig from his water bottle, and ventures out into the heart of the woods. Who can blame him, really? We all need a change sometimes, and it's not like this poor young man has any idea what's in store for him out there. His boots crunch on the undergrowth, small things skittering out from amongst the dry leaves and twigs. He always encountered other people on his usual trail, which was fine, of course. He didn't mind a little socializing on his walks. But there's something oddly comforting about the true loneliness you can find in the woods. It's just nature and you, properly acquainted. No screens, no keyboards, no emails, texts, DMs, or obligations. It's natural, the way things should be. The young man closes his eyes for a moment and takes a deep breath in, just to enjoy it. That beautiful, clean spring air. A pleasure money can't buy. When he opens his eyes, he notices something in the distance, even deeper in the forest than before. It's large and brilliant white. Some kind of structure. How strange, he thinks. There are no paths leading to this thing, whatever it is. How could it have been built? And why? Was it another one of those weird obelisks that appeared in the desert a couple of years before that he saw on the news? It's the most interesting little mystery he's experienced in a while, and nothing about it seems to be throwing up any overt red flags. What would be the harm in going a little deeper to check it out? The question would certainly stay with him if he never found out. As he approaches, he notices that it's a large cube made from some strange, glossy plastic. There are no gaps or rivets, no real signs of how the cube was constructed at all. The only thing differentiating any of the sides is a metal door on one of the faces. He circles the cube a couple of times just to see if he's missing anything. Nothing really appears out of the ordinary, other than the very existence of the cube itself. He looks over his shoulder before approaching the door. No cameras, nobody waiting in the bushes to jump him. Not yet, at least. He steps forward, takes an uneasy breath, and opens the front door. It's a slow, cautious motion, 
After all, he has no idea what could be waiting for him inside. For all he knew, the whole cube would be primed to explode, with the opening of the front door being the activation mechanism. But no, what surprises him most is how oddly mundane the inside is. He takes out his phone, turns on the flashlight, and shines it inside. It's just an empty room, pretty much exactly what you'd expect the least imaginative person in the world to suggest is inside a big plastic cube in the woods. Huh? Two strange little things catch his eye, though. Two doors on the adjoining back walls of the cube, a door to each wall. Huh? That can't be right. Doubting his own memory, the young man steps out and circumnavigates the cube again. There are no apertures in the back walls of the cube, so the doors inside would just lead to nowhere. Perhaps it's some kind of unfinished construction project, he muses. He'd read all about modular living and tiny homes. Maybe the plan was simply to cut in those two extra doors at a later date and fit in a skylight. People live in retrofitted shipping containers these days. Stranger things have definitely happened. Still, there it is again. That same nagging curiosity that brought him here in the first place. Even though he knows, logically, the two doors inside the cube lead to nowhere, he knows that if he leaves without trying them himself, it'd stick with him. He's just that kind of guy. The unanswered question weighs on him like a ship's anchor tied around his neck. It's always better to just… know. He ventures inside the cube again, lit once more by his phone's flashlight, and tries the door on the left. Even though he knows it should be a dead end, he still does it with that same trepidation as before, like there could be something waiting behind it. Something with big eyes and even bigger teeth. He'll feel so silly for even worrying about this when he sees the wall on the other side. But that isn't what he sees. In fact, to his immense surprise, the door opens up into the interior of what seems like an identical cube. He's so shocked by the impossibility of it that he steps back, the door swinging back into place. No, 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 he thinks. That's impossible. He shakes his head and rubs his eyes. It had to be some trick or illusion. There's no possible way that this door can lead anywhere. He steps forward and, with great care, opens the door again. Nothing has changed. There's still an identical room to the one he's standing in, just waiting for him on the other side of the door. Huh? Maybe it's a projection or a mirror? Some kind of advanced AR tech being experimented on in the woods? The young man reaches forward. His hand slips across the threshold into the new room. It's real. It's an actual space beyond the doorway. There's even another two doors on the far wall. What on earth is going on? Wanting to be sure he isn't just going crazy, he leaves the cube one more time and checks the back walls. He runs his hand across them, smooth plastic, no seams, no tricks, nothing hidden. There is no explanation for what's going on in there. He's discovered something truly remarkable, an exception to the laws of physics as we know them, an anomaly in space. The sensible thing to do would have been to leave that second, find somewhere with cell service, and call other people to come check it out. If that had been the case, then things would have ended very differently for this young man. Instead, he decides to play pioneer. If there are other doors beyond the one into the impossible room, where do they lead? Are there even more incredible secrets just waiting for him to find them? He doesn't want to just be the person who dialed in about the initial discovery, while other people took over and did the exciting parts. Chances are, if he calls in about this, some shady government group will come and take the issue off his hands. He'll never know the true secret. It'll nag at him for the rest of his life. And he can't have that, can he? Guided again by the light of his phone, he enters the cube. After checking that the door on the right leads to exactly the same new room, he opens the left door once more and proceeds through, letting it close behind him. He looks around the room. It's absolutely identical, down to the smallest detail not a crack or smudge out of place. He approaches the doors and looks beyond them, exactly as he's predicted, and on some level, hoped. There are more identical rooms on the other side. There's breaking the laws of physics, and then there's dropping a nuclear bomb on them. It all begins to go to his head. As he passes through each door, the only thing that seems to alter is the placement of the doors on the walls. It seems a little disorienting at first, like the room is being spun around from below, but he soon gets used to it. It's strange. Going into a series of identical rooms doesn't scream exciting in the abstract. But when you know those rooms are impossible, it adds a certain layer of intrigue to the proceedings. Eventually, he comes upon something strange. After so long essentially seeing the same room repeated at him, he's primed to notice even the smallest difference. As he scans the floor with the light of his phone, he notices a boot print on the ground. 
It looks a couple sizes bigger than his own, with a completely different tread pattern. The thought dawns on him with a difficult mix of emotions. He isn't the only one who's been in here. And maybe he's not even alone in here. He's never been the suspicious type. He likes to see the good in everyone and assume a basic level of human decency. But something about the knowledge that another person could be in here filled him with torrents of icy dread. It's a dread so great that it even overrides his curiosity. He knows on some animal level that he needs to leave right now or something terrible is going to happen to him. He turns and it suddenly dawns on him. He doesn't remember which of the three doors in the room he entered through. In fact, he sped through so many rooms to get here, he can't remember which door he came through in any of them. The cold, thrumming pulse of dread soon heats up into panic. He tries to regulate his breathing. He needs to approach the situation logically. But how do you apply logic to a situation that's completely beyond it? He picks a door after an intense session of eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and commits, heading through it into an identical room, and then another, and then another, and then another. He checks his phone, his only light source, and feels another spike of panic when he realizes just how low the batteries are. Who would have known how quickly the flashlight eats up charge? But without it, it's total darkness. He'll have no way out. He needs to get out before his battery runs out, or he'll never get out at all. Faster and faster, he passes through doors at random on the confidence that anyone who walks long enough will end up somewhere. He's looking for changes, landmarks, any signs of salvation. He finds, to his immense relief, that some doors have little red dots marked next to them on the wall in permanent marker. Whoever was here before might save him now. This relief has some cold water thrown on it by another scrawling a few rooms down. Someone had messily written, this is hell, on the wall in red, except this time, it wasn't a pen that left the markings. At the bottom of the wall, he can see a few bloody fingernail chunks sitting in a dry brown puddle. Had they gotten out, whoever they are? Or is their skeleton festering in one of these rooms? At this point, the young man is mortally terrified. Never before has death seemed like such a tangible presence, and not a quick death, but starvation and dehydration, two of the most terrible ways to go of all. He can feel hot tears running down his cheeks. He picks himself up, trying to choke out the sobs before they can rack his body. He needs to keep moving. Next room, next room, next room, next room, next room. With each one, hope shrinks and despair grows. There's no light, no progress, just the same thing over and over again. It's so relentless that, at some point, he needs to stop and catch his breath. He's breathing raggedly, his lungs burn, he's been getting nowhere at impressive speeds. It's only when he manages to slow his heart rate and quiet his breathing that he notices he's not the only one in the room. Their breathing is even more strained and wheezy than his. He turns slowly, almost paralyzed by fear, and turns the waning light of his phone into the corner of the room. There's a figure standing in the corner of the room. It's a person, but not the kind of person you ever want to run into. They're filthy and gaunt with deep-set wild eyes, their mangled fingertips, nails broken off, are crusted over in red. Their teeth, which appear long thanks to recessed gums, chatter against each other. I didn't ever think you'd find me, they say, voice a rattling whimper. Have you come to help me out? The young man doesn't know what to say. He's wrapped in a mix of pity and terror for the pitiful human being before him. How long had they been in here, just sitting in the dark, alone? The thought sickens him. I'm sorry, the young man says without thinking. I'm lost too. The stranger heaves a dry sob. No, I'm sorry, the stranger says. I'm just so hungry. Before the young man can say another word, the stranger is on him. They've got the strength of desperate insanity. Their bony, blood-stained hands clasp around the man's neck. The attack is so sudden, so shocking, so brutal. He screams and drops his phone. It tumbles to the ground and shatters. The horrors that happen next all transpire in the dark. The young man screams, but nobody with any interest in helping can hear him. Being trapped will do strange things to a person, but you don't need to tell anyone trapped in SCP-167 that. Also known as the Infinite Labyrinth, this anomaly is an absolute nightmare for anyone suffering from claustrophobia, the fear of enclosed spaces. Which is not to say it shouldn't also be terrifying to pretty much everybody else. The anomaly doesn't look like much to the casual observer, perhaps a work of avant-garde art or a particularly unwelcoming public bathroom. It's a cube measuring 10 meters around its edges, made from a shiny white plastic polymer 
with a large metal door affixed to the front. At face value, it seems to exhibit no anomalous spatial qualities, with the inner chamber having consistent internal dimensions with the outside. Two of the three remaining walls in the chamber display a pair of identical metal doors. Despite logically leading back outside of the cube, both of these doors instead open up to identical rooms, each of which also have two doors. This goes on, to the best of our knowledge, in perpetuity. Studies indicate that this anomaly has been explored extensively by people in the past, due to a high number of markings and unusual items from a number of time periods being left inside. Religious idols circa 500 BCE, several treasure chests circa 1500 CE, and even several SCPs, the specifics of which I am sadly not at liberty to share here. The complexity of the labyrinth isn't the only thing creating a risk of being lost within. All signs point to the anomaly having non-Euclidean geometry. Multiple researchers sent into SCP-167, each attached to the opening with a lifeline to prevent them getting lost, found that their experience getting to the same point involved passing through a number of vastly different rooms. It is currently unknown what causes these spatial distortions. Foundation researchers are extremely curious about potential connections to SCP-184, an object also known as the Architect, which causes notable spatial distortions inside any building wherein it is placed. Cross-tests between the two anomalies are currently pending approval from the O5 Council. Because the anomaly appears largely benign, one researcher even pitched using 167 as temporary storage space for low-risk anomalies. However, just because an anomaly is typically benign doesn't mean terrible accidents can't happen when the proper safety precautions aren't followed. The following note on the file from lead researcher Dr. Klein illustrates one notable incident of a tragedy as a result of lax safety procedures. As most of you are aware, an SCP Foundation senior researcher was videotaped entering SCP-167 several days ago without the requisite ball of twine, and he has not yet returned. His ultimate fate is unknown, but the search teams have turned up nothing. Let this be a reminder to all of you just how easy it could be to get lost in there if you don't utilize some method of marking your path. If I find that any other researcher has disobeyed the safety regulations and entered without a ball of twine, no matter how far deep they intend to go, they will find themselves being transferred to another facility for researching Keter-class SCPs, where they should have ample motivation to learn to follow safety regulations quite quickly. Signed, Dr. Klein. Because of its lack of sentience and static nature, SCP-167 has been given the safe object class. It has been removed from the forest and is kept in a padlocked room within Research Command 06, and anyone who seeks to conduct explorations into the interior of the anomaly must obtain permission from a relevant member of personnel with clearance level 3 or above. And remember, no matter where you're going, whether that be into the local forest or an anomalous cube, you're heading for disaster if you haven't planned how you're getting back. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-1051, Nevadan Extraterrestrial, for another anomalous location that you'd do anything to avoid getting trapped in. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.